the mountain of jewels and gold in the open space opposite Pangaea Castle was getting higher and higher, and it was really close to the top of the former, but finally the five elders gave the order to stop. They considered that raising the height of this mountain to the level of or beyond the castle would be an affront and disrespectful to the celestial dragons. Despite this, the impressive magnitude of this mountain of gold and jewels shocked the entire world. The world seemed to fall silent, only the roar of the waves in the sea could be heard. Are you kidding me? Buggy, who was watching the broadcast in the cabin of the ship, although he was only 15 years old, had the same appearance as in the future he looked at the golden mountain in the screen and roared. If we had this amount of treasure, we wouldn't be simple pirates. Buggy looked with envy at the countless amount of gold and jewels. He couldn't have so much even if he searched for treasures all his life, right? Ayaha! Where the hell are these guys taking me? He screamed, clutching his head in a state of extreme distress. When he was wandering in the east blue, those mysterious men in black suddenly appeared in front of him. Without saying a word, they hit him and left him unconscious. When he woke up, he was on this ship. The place we're taking you is Punk Hazard, the secret base of the Special Science Group, sorry, it's now the Academy of Sciences. At this time, a man in black opened the door and walked in with a smile. Why are you sending me there? Seeing that there was finally someone to communicate with, Buggy quickly stood up and asked. Because we have seen your talent in weapons research, you will be taught more professional knowledge there. From now on you can seriously become a scientist in the field of weapons. Buggy was stunned. He opened his mouth and didn't know what to say. He could only ask in confusion, how do you know that I have been studying new weapons recently? Obviously. I only had the idea last week. How funny and outrageous is this? Just a week ago, he started getting interested in it and he didn't even have all the materials for the research. And now, someone from the world government came to tell him how talented he is in this area and also used strong methods to arrest him. Was the purpose to send him to a place to study? The man in black in front of him was also confused. He blinked a few times not knowing what to do or say in this situation. Well, you should know Shanks. You two were on the same boat before. By the way, he was the one who told us that you are particularly talented in this area. The man in black coughed twice and reluctantly found an excuse. Shanks. Buggy exploded instantly. His teeth became sharp fangs, and he burned with fury. He couldn't believe that idiot had tricked him again. Previously, it was because of him that he ended up eating the chop-chop fruit and became a landlubber, losing access to many underwater treasures. Where is he now? Cough, Shanks. It was discovered that he has the blood of the celestial dragons. So they sent him back to marry Geoase. Buggy's face froze, and three big golden question marks popped up on his head, and he shouted in disbelief, What are you talking about? That bastard Shanks is a celestial dragon. 1. The man in black nodded solemnly and said, Yes, so I advise you to be careful with your words. You don't want to be arrested in Punk Hazard for showing disrespect towards the celestial dragons. Why, why him, do you have any evidence? Buggy asked through gritted teeth, with uncontrollable envy in his tone. A celestial dragon. That was infinite wealth, supreme status, and always protected by navy admirals. Oh, he wanted that too. Pangaea Castle. Room of Authority. Next is the Levely. Warkuri said, sitting on the sofa, with a serious and solemn face. Mars asked, as for the towns where the slaves are settling, have the constructions been completed? Previously, they considered that after the approval of the Levely issues, they would not be able to free all of Mary Geoasa's slaves at once, as many of them were mentally disturbed or harbored strong resentment towards the world government. Therefore, it was discussed that only 10,000 selected people would be released through the world live broadcast, and the remaining people would be placed under house arrest somewhere in the Red Earth continent, and then psychologists would be sent to try to see if they could recover. As for those whose hatred is really too deep, 
they can only be dealt with secretly. It's almost ready. Warkiri responded. Meanwhile, the news coup loaded with newspapers waved their wings, flying towards different parts of the world. The content inside was about today's event, the live reveal of One Piece. Although thanks to the instant transmission ability of the Den Den Mushi, most people around the world already knew about this at this time, like a newspaper, this crucial event that could even be recorded in history must be documented in their own pages. Otherwise it would be unprofessional. Therefore, the headline on the front page of the newspaper in the extra edition announced, The Day the Legend of One Piece Ends. The second half of the Grand Line, the New World Sea Area, Punk Hazard. The island was covered by a dense green forest. In this vast jungle lies the former special science group, now the research base of the Academy of Sciences. The atmosphere in the entire facility was extremely serious and solemn, among the occasional roars of beasts. The fusion of items and zoan-type devil fruits. In a laboratory packed with monitors, a middle-aged man, about six feet tall with a disproportionately large head resembling a radish, was wearing a loose white coat. He looked at the contents of a file, reading line by line. He was Vegapunk, the current director of the Academy of Sciences and head of the Institute of Devil Fruit Studies. Interesting. This information was kept in a lockbox by members of CP6 and escorted over three hours ago. He originally thought it was a professional report from other researchers. But after looking at it, he discovered that the content is confusing and lax. There is no experimental data, and it is all guesswork. These seemingly random conjectures caught his eye. Although the whole article is full of unrigorous speculations, it did point me to a relatively clear research direction. This also makes Vegapunk's mood more complicated. He is now a little worried about whether the world government has found a researcher who can replace him. Not that he had much love for the world government. After all, he was forcibly brought here but he had to admit that here he could investigate without restrictions, money, equipment, research materials, everything he needed was available. Hey, what is this? Just when he was about to pack up the documents, Vegapunk was surprised to find that there was another document envelope in the lockbox. He opened it and took it out, and his pupils suddenly trembled. Climate Improvement Plan for Future Country Baltimore after reading the contents of the plan, his hands trembled a little. The world government was actually prepared to help him solve the extreme cold climate in his hometown. Vegapunk understood the intention of the world government. There was a long silence. Vegapunk sat in his chair, looking at the document in his hands. He was moved, but logic told him that it was a bribe from the world government. So the question arose. Can their loyalty be bought in exchange for ensuring the happy future of their home? Dr. Vegapunk, the CP6 ship has entered the port, and they have brought Buggy, the former intern of the Roger Pirates. Buggy, is that the kid who is said to be very talented in explosives? Let's take him to the guest room to rest. Give him a day to get familiar with the environment here and start arranging a teacher for him the day after tomorrow. To be honest, Vegapunk is really not interested in explosives, and he has no time to teach Buggy himself. Now he just wants to continue to invest in the research of Devil Fruits. Understood. Also, bring me two Zoan-type Devil Fruits and two famous swords for my experiments. Yes. Shurororo. Teacher, did you call me? Caesar, walked into Professor Fritz's research room. They were on level 5.5 of Impel Down, the secret base of the Biochemical Research Institute directly affiliated with the Academy of Sciences of the World Government. Well, an order has just arrived from Mary Gosa, asking us to send people to Area RL1556 to assist the construction department in constructing a biochemical security station with isolation, sterilization and disinfection functions. We also have to wear 30 advanced chemical protection suits. Hearing this, Caesar, looked surprised. RL. I remember, isn't that the Red Earth continent? Why build a biochemical safety station there? Would anyone dare to release biochemical weapons there? 
Also, what do they need chemical protective suits for? Hearing the three consecutive questions from his student, Professor Fritz rubbed his brows with a headache and sighed. I don't know either. Don't you know the temper of the world government? Since they haven't explained it, it means we shouldn't know, so don't ask around. Remember this, it can save your life. Okay. Caesar was unhappy. Be careful when you go there. Although you are only 16 years old, you still know how to operate a biochemical safety station, right? Professor Fritz raised his head and asked. Caesar nodded excitedly and said with a smile, Okay, okay, I just want to go up there and take a walk. Hey, be careful when you go there. Don't run around. Every word you say must be carefully considered. It's best not to say a word about anything that has nothing to do with work. Professor Fritz continued to give his instructions earnestly. Shurororo. I got it teacher. Caesar chuckled, thinking that the professor was exaggerating about the danger of the Red Earth continent. Professor Fritz looked at his careless look and knew that he didn't take his words to heart at all. He shook his head helplessly, and then handed over a piece of information on the table. By the way, look at this. What is it? Caesar, curious, took the document and began to read it. His eyes were shining as he read the document. The document dealt with conjectures of new biochemical weapons based on biological gases, in addition to the description of different viruses and paralyzing drugs. It's strange. I was ordered to give you this document and to investigate it on your own. Professor Fritz was also full of doubts. After Caesar finished reading the document, he felt excited. So he quickly turned around and ran towards the door of the investigation room. Teacher. I'm going to the Red Earth Continent right now. Now he wants to visit the Red Earth Continent and also wants to start studying the interesting content of the document right away, but he doesn't want to choose one or the other, he wants both. Professor Fritz looked at the automatically closing door, smiled resignedly, and at the same time, his gaze became deep. He wondered where the world government had gotten all this information from. The key point is that whether it is biochemical weapons based on biological gases, or the different types of viruses mentioned, they are all dangerous biochemical weapons that are highly contagious. To be honest, his bottom line has not been broken yet, so subconsciously he doesn't want to study it. But on the other hand, according to the document's conjectures, viruses can not only be used as weapons but can also serve as a treatment for certain diseases and in fact if this is achieved it can save many people. An internal struggle, a painful indecision. But, if he disobeyed the world government's orders about conducting the research, he could no longer be the director of the Biochemical Research Institute. Furthermore, after all these years, he knew too many secrets, which would probably result in his elimination. Okay, forget it. I will do it for the good of the people and for my wife and daughter. The rest, let's leave it in the hands of the world government. Professor Fritz comforted himself in a low voice. Dash. Chapter 82, Chapter 82, Preparations, Kaido officially enters Impel Down. Fishman Island, Mermaid Beach. Kuzan watched Garp get off the warship in surprise, and quickly approached to greet him. Vice Admiral Garp, why are you here? Wahaha. I was just passing through. I thought I'd stop by and see how things are going around here with the construction of this branch. Anyway, the coding technology here is the best in the world. It won't take much time and won't delay things. Garp raised his neck and laughed boldly, attracting the curious eyes of many mermaid ladies around him, because they had also watched the live broadcast before. So I am particularly curious about this naval hero who can blow up such an exaggerated super tsunami with one punch. Come on, take me to see how the branch here is different from the ones above. Under the admiring gazes of the navy soldiers on both sides, Garp strode away with Kuzan, who was one step behind and leading the way from the side. 1. By the way, is Kaido imprisoned on your ship? Can I see it? Kuzan asked with a smile while putting his hands in his trouser pockets. 
Garp agreed nonchalantly and said, Sure, when I'm leaving, you can come with me to take a look. That boy's appearance is really interesting, he's over seven meters tall and has long bull-like horns on his head. Thank you, Vice Admiral Garp. It didn't take long before the two of them, accompanied by a group of subordinates, arrived at the branch construction site. Most of it was already finished, showing outlines and a basic style. Hey, it's really different from the branch above. The roofs are all made of big shells. It's interesting. This is the first time I've seen this kind of marine branch. Garp exclaimed happily, taking out a bag of senbei from Justice's cloak's large pocket and ate it. He also handed a piece to Kuzan, who didn't refuse and bit off a piece. Vice Admiral, I have just received an order to go to the extreme ice continent in search of the treasure of the Qinjiao family of Kano country, the jewel ice sheet. Qinjiao? Wahaha! Garp laughed loudly when he heard this familiar name. I've heard about this too. Ever since I punched him in the head, he can no longer take out the treasures under the ice, so he has to go there once a year to take a look. After saying that, he thought of something, turned to look at Kuzan, and said, Be careful when you encounter him when you go there. Although that guy has lost half of his combat power after losing his pointed head, his Busos Hoku Haki and Hashoken martial art are still a threat to you. Okay. Kuzan obediently accepted the warning and said immediately, However, I can't spare time now. The levelly is about to be held. I will definitely be responsible for escorting King Neptune and Princess Odo him. Indeed, those royal families located far away from the Four Seas should have already set off. Garp nodded. He didn't know how many levelly he had experienced. He was too familiar with it. So I can only go to the extreme ice continent after levelly, but there is another problem. This place is too far from the extreme ice continent. It will take several months to go back and forth. During this time, there will be no one protecting Fishman Island. Kuzan looked worried. As you know, this area often receives pirates from the New World. Although my marines can deal with ordinary pirates, if it is a tougher situation, they will not be able to do so. We need a vice admiral in command of the branch. Garp immediately understood what the boy was implying stuck a finger up his nose and looked at him with a mischievous look, mockingly saying, Are you asking me to take care of this place for you? Da ha ha! Kuzan laughed as he nodded. You brat, okay, I have nothing to do anyway. Garp easily accepted Kuzan's proposal, and then said, Okay, I've seen enough. I'm going to meet King Neptune first. You continue with your work. Ah! Uh, Take care of yourself then. Kuzan bowed respectfully as he dismissed Garp. Meanwhile, many kings of the four seas who had seats on the levelly headed towards Reverse Mountain along with their royal escort, following the arrival of the navy ships. The kings in the first half and second half of the Grand Line were a little more relaxed and did not need to set off so many days in advance, but they could already feel that this year's levelly was unusual. The movements of the world government this year are really eye-catching. It has long aroused the worry, vigilance and expectation of many people. At this moment, all currents, whether overt or clandestine, were converging toward Mary Gosa. Inside Castle Pangaea, the instigator of all this turmoil and chaos was reviewing the latest reminder of the system just discovered this morning. Compared to the previous introduction, this explanation looks more like a complete version. However, judging from the date displayed, it appeared on the second day after he activated the first dimensional gate. However, there was no notification on the star chart, making him read it only today. This also reminds Imu that it is better to check the star map every day in the future. Otherwise, it is very easy to ignore new information. In addition to obtaining the authority to open a small dimensional gate to a random planet every year, every three years, one of the three small dimensional gates can be upgraded to a medium dimensional gate. In addition to obtaining a small dimensional gate as usual in the tenth year, you can also upgrade one of the three medium-sized dimensional gates to a large dimensional gate. 
The medium-sized dimensional gate is 300 meters high and 200 meters wide, and the large dimensional gate is 30,000 meters high and 20,000 meters wide. 2. Seeing this, Imu could tell. Isn't this a naked attempt to lure him into launching a large-scale interstellar invasion? Previously, he felt that the small Stargate, which was 3 meters high and 2 meters wide, was too small. It would take a long time for a large force to pass through it, and large vehicles, warships, etc. could not enter at all. This medium-sized dimensional gate is completely different. Even giants can easily enter. In addition, here is a detailed explanation of his specific control over the dimensional gate. He can freely adjust the dimensional gate switch, freely adjust the dimensional gate position, and can freely observe the surroundings of the dimensional gate. The observation range depends on the star gate level. Small dimensional gates have a radius of 100 meters, medium have a radius of 1000 meters, and large have a radius of 10,000 meters. He only needs to use mental commands to operate them. However, when adjusting the location of a dimensional gate, he can only adjust it from one side. For example, he was in Starfish, One Piece World, and then he opened the dimensional door in front of him, but in the opposite world, the dimensional door appeared in the sea. If he wants to move the dimensional gate to the Navy headquarters, he only needs to keep its concept, location, and specific images in mind and can directly place the dimensional gate there. However, the location of the world opposite the dimensional gate is still on the sea. If you want to move the dimensional gate to a place outside the observation range, you must personally go through the dimensional gate to the other world and then adjust the position of the dimensional gate in that world. After checking the latest directions on the star map, Imo took the Den Den Mushi's handset and dialed some numbers on the rotating dial. Soon. The Den Den Mushi imitated Ju Peter's appearance and spoke respectfully. Imu Sama. Imu asked, Has the first batch of Cypher Paul been selected to be sent into the dimensional gate? It has been selected. I am going to send CP9 headed by Lasky. There are ten people. Two of them are responsible for guarding the dimensional gate. The remaining eight people are divided into four teams to explore in four directions. Since we don't yet know whether the Den Den Mushi can be used normally in another world and whether it can be connected across dimensional gates, we still need to complete experiments in this area. But these will have to wait until the construction of the biochemical safety station is completed, and then researchers wearing high-end chemical protective suits will first detect the air components in the other world. Ju Peter briefly explained the plan conceived by the experts under his leadership. Biological and chemical safety stations are indeed necessary. Imu nodded silently, acknowledging his prudence and caution. No one knew if the air of that other world contained bacteria or particular gases, and Imu feared that the envoys would bring them back to the home world. Is there a definite time? In terms of the construction department, according to the guidance of the Biochemical Research Institute, it has been determined that the biochemical safety station will take 20 days to build, which happened to be three days before this levely. Ju Peter replied. It takes time to test the air and at the same time, a call test can also be done with the Den Den Mushi. If there is no big problem, send to CP9 on levely day. Imu thinks that day is quite memorable, and he is now looking forward to what the world behind this first dimensional gate will be like. Yes. Ju Peter answered and waited for Imu to finish the call before putting away the Den Den Mushi. It seems confirmed. Warkuri said in a serious tone. Well, we are about to come into contact with another world, or even another civilization on another planet. Ju Peter showed a smile and then looked at Nusjuro. The outside of the biochemical security station will definitely need to be guarded by the military. Although it is unlikely, no one knows whether creatures from that world will break in once the dimensional gate is opened again. Nusjuro understood that, so he responded. This is not a problem. There will be a prepared army, with automatic weapons and armored vehicles, such as tanks, in charge of guarding the RL1556 area. Additionally, 
Area RL1556 is adjacent to the newly rebuilt Army headquarters in Area RL1555. If anything difficult happens, the large force can provide immediate support, and there is also Douglas Bullet. Jew Peter said, just changing the uniforms is not enough. No matter how good the equipment is, it cannot be called a first-class army if the quality of the soldiers is insufficient. Nusjuro nodded and said, that's why Imusama transferred Bullet to the army, but it will definitely take some time to train the troops, so we can't rush it. Is it possible to consider sending some navy there, or directly transfer part of the navy to the army? Saturn asked. If Imusama didn't mention the navy's involvement, he must have his reasons. And the navy has a lot of things to deal with, so let's leave them alone for now. At the same time, just when countries around the world had just returned to come after the public live broadcast of One Piece, and then faced the second hustle and bustle of the Levely, the large underwater prison, Impel Down, once again welcomed a big figure. Hey, this is my first time here. I don't know how it is different from other prisons. I'm eager to see if he can keep me. Wearing special sea stone handcuffs, Kaido stepped off the warship under the surveillance of Garp and a group of naval officers. He looked at the huge iron door in front of him and the forbidding internal environment rebelliously. Bahaha! I have never heard or seen anyone leave here. If you can do it, you will be the first since the founding of the world government. I will be happy to bring you back personally. Garp joked, laughing out loud. Come in quickly, there are some old acquaintances of yours inside, you can catch up and reminisce about old times. Kaido glanced at the jailers who came out to greet them, the most conspicuous ones were Vice Warden Magellan and Gecko Moria. He blinked and asked, is there any wine in there? How do I know if I've never been there? Just go in and ask. Garp bit a piece of his senbei, waved to Magellan, and then turned and left. There is definitely no wine, but we will turn on the water pipe later and you can drink as much as you want. Think of it as a welcome gift to impel down that we have prepared for you. Magellan walked over and looked at him expressionlessly, then stepped aside to get out of the way, and said again, I think you don't need to be pushed, Kaido. Wororo. The horns on your head are very similar to mine, but believe it or not, I will be able to come out of here in less than a year. Kaido said loudly and confidently. After speaking, he puffed up his chest and strode towards the gate like a general after a victorious battle. Magellan was noncommittal and had no interest in replying. Instead, Gecko Moria, who was still a young prison guard, sneered while holding the big scissors in his hand. Kishishishi. I really don't believe it. Do you think you can do things I can't do? 2. Dash. Chapter 83, Chapter 83, The Gate to the Unknown. First part of the Grand Line, Sandy Island, Arabasta Kingdom. A world government ship began to approach the city of Nanohana. Once the ship docked at the port, a group of officials immediately came to receive the men dressed in black who began to disembark. At the same time one of the officials immediately sent several guards to inform King Nefertari Cobra. Two hours later, King Cobra was sitting on the throne. Below the stage were the commander of the royal guard, Igaram, and the two head guards. At this time, the sound of leather boots hitting the floor came from outside, and then five expressionless men in black walked in, exuding an aura of indifference. Seeing the appearance of these people, Igaram, and the two guards showed cautious expressions. Greetings to King Nefertari Cobra. I am Warner, Senior Director of the Department of Historical Research and Historical Text Processing. The leader introduced himself in a serious manner. 2. This made King Cobra frown. Historical Text Processing Department. This immediately reminded him of the information that only kings could know and that was passed down from generation to generation. We came here this time because we received reliable information that there is a pwn glyph hidden in the tomb of the kings of your country, and it also records the location of one of the three ancient weapons, Pluton. 1. Senior Director Warner continued with cold words, as his gaze became sharper, which alerted the Cobra King. 
Despite that, he remained calm. Where did your information come from? How can you be sure it is reliable? Is there any evidence? If so, can you show it to me? This is confidential, no comment. You just need to cooperate with us to let us enter the Arab Astapone glyph chamber under the tomb of the kings and verify. King Cobra's expression became serious, and he said in a deep voice, Since you know about the tomb of the kings, you should understand its significance to Arabasta and the Nefertari family. I won't allow you to go and do whatever you want. As soon as he finished speaking, Igaram and the two royal guards stepped forward, their gazes fixed on the five men in black in front of them, but the latter simply ignored them. We're not going to cause any trouble, we just want to see if there is a pone glyph. If there is, we will take it with us. If not, we will not hold Arabasta responsible. Senior Director Warner said. I am saying that you should produce evidence. If there is really any evidence, then I can accompany you. If not, I'm sorry, but I can't allow it. The Cobra King spoke firmly, but this also made the atmosphere between the two parties become tense. Senior Director Warner was silent for a moment, and the corner of his mouth curled up into a sneer. Evidence He raised his right hand and one of his men took a photograph out of his pocket, then threw it towards Igaram. What are you doing? The two head guards reacted instantly, drawing their weapons. The king's soldiers also pointed their weapons at the men in black. Don't make any reckless moves. Igaram grabbed the photo, which arrived without much force, understanding that there was no intention to hurt. He quickly went up to the stand and handed her to King Cobra. When King Cobra saw the photo, his pupils shrank, showing fury on his face. He slammed the throne angrily and stood up. How dare you barge into the sacred territory of the Tomb of the Kings? Who gave you that right? In the photograph was the pone glyph on display at the Arabasta pone glyph chamber. We are just going to get the evidence you just requested. Now, you have seen the evidence, haven't you? Warner's senior director restrained his sneer and looked at the other party expressionlessly. Now, please make a decision whether to cooperate with us in taking away the historical text, or to resist the ban of the world government. Now, please make a decision, collaborate and allow us to take the pone glyph or defy the world government's ban. Dead silence. After a long silence and internal conflict, the young Cobra King finally sighed and with a wave of his hand ordered, Igaram, Vice Commander Ulan, take them to the Tomb of the Kings, but do not allow them to touch anything but the pone glyph. King, that is the resting place of ancient kings. The other vice commander of the royal guard intervened. All right, vice commander NAS. King Cobra waved his hand to signal the other party to stop talking. Then we retreat. Senior Director Warner nodded with some disappointment, then turned around and left with the others. Your Majesty, why are you so afraid of them? After everyone left, vice commander NAS, turned red angrily. We have 600,000 royal troops, millions of citizens willing to fight for the kingdom and Vice Commander Ulan and me. Even if we lack ships to face them at sea, we should be more than enough to prevent the world government's attack. Hearing this, King Cobra would have thought it was reasonable before. After all, Arabasta's national strength is the undisputed number one among all the affiliated nations. But ever since he watched the live broadcast of the One Piece Great Battle, he now looked at the Vice Commander with confusion. General NAS, didn't you watch the live broadcast of the world a few days ago? If you are talking about the great treasure of the Pirate King, I really don't pay attention to it, nor am I interested in paying attention to it. It is better to train the troops or exercise your own strength. Vice Commander NAS replied solemnly. King Cobra was suddenly speechless. He also realized that he had a hard time explaining how powerful Navy admirals were. Even if he made some general remarks, NAS would probably not believe it. He thought for a while and prepared to talk about it from another angle. Vice Commander NAS, if we completely break with the world government, the Navy will launch a full-scale attack. 
even if our royal troops can resist, the peace of our people will be affected. Now they live in harmony, why risk everything for a stone that we don't understand and plunge the nation into chaos? King Cobra's earnest words rippled through the entire hall and reached the ears of every king's army soldier, making their resolute expression slightly moved. As a descendant of the Nefertari family, it is indeed my incompetence not to be able to protect the pone glyph passed down by my ancestors and allow outsiders to enter the tomb of the kings without authorization and disturb the rest of the ancient kings. But as king of Arabasta, my first responsibility is to ensure the peace and stability of the kingdom. We should not risk everything for a stone. Every word of the young king was firm and direct. Such a determined and wise king, he hugged his princess and cried loudly as soon as he returned to the bedroom, with tears pouring out of his eyes like water. However, this very determined king, once in his bedroom, embraced his queen and cried bitterly, tears that flowed like water. T.T., I have disappointed the ancient kings. He sobbed. 1. September 12, 1498 2. The levelly was still three days away, but near Mary Gosa the royal ships from all over the world had already arrived. This day is destined to be recorded in history in the future. Just yesterday, the biochemical safety station built by the construction department and the biochemical research institute in the RL1556 area of Red Earth continent was officially completed. At the core of the security station, Caesar Clown led six investigators and six members of CP7. All of them were wearing protective suits of a striking light yellow color, somewhat bulky. On the shelves around them, there are various types of Den Den Mushi and professional equipment for air detection. Behind them is a silver-white electrical closed gate. At the same time, there are four surveillance Den Den Mushi placed in the corners of the ceiling. They transmit images in real time without blind spots to the Cypher Paul headquarters located in the RL1999 area, as well as to the room of the authority where the five elders are located and to Imus Tree House. Caesar was excited, so much so that he trembled a little, although he maintained a hint of skepticism. His yellowish-brown pupils focused intently on the energy gate less than 20 meters in front of him, shining with starbursts and a rim of blue light that clung to the ground. Caesar never imagined that one of the biochemical safety suits he had brought would end up being put on himself, much less that he would put it on voluntarily. All of this was because of this door in front of him. He and other researchers had been briefed on the basic situation a few days ago. It is said that behind this gate there is another world, and their mission is to test if the air there is safe and, in the process, test if the Den Den Mushi can still be used as usual. Honestly, his first reaction was to think it was a fake. But as the biological and chemical security station was gradually completed, and he found a large group of soldiers armed with automatic rifles and even driving tanks, and they were very serious about building defenses outside, he became a little convinced. Let me see, is this a conspiracy or is it true? Caesar in the biochemical suit stretched out his tongue nervously and licked his dry lips. The next moment, the countless starlights on the gate began to rotate, spinning faster and faster, almost connecting into circular lines, and finally disappeared before the eyes, revealing a landscape of blue sky, white clouds, green mountains, and grassland. Someone is controlling this thing. This was the first key point that Caesar noticed at this moment. So there is another world inside. A researcher pointed at the dimensional gate and asked hesitantly. Although he was mentally prepared, it was still a bit unbelievable when it actually appeared in front of his eyes. Please ask the security personnel to enter dimensional gate no one. The six CP7 members wearing protective suits looked at each other, then divided into two parts, one in front and one behind, and passed through the dimensional gate into another world. The small dimensional gate is two meters wide, which is quite spacious for them. The first three people to enter also have a Den Den Mushi in their hands. Please have the research personnel pass through Dimensional Gate No. 1. The cold voice sounded from the speakers on the wall. Finally it's our turn. Caesar saw that the six people in front of him had actually entered the interior of the Dimensional Gate, 
and he quickly followed with the six researchers with excitement on his face. Meanwhile, at the Cipher Paul headquarters, Ju Peter was standing in the command center, watching the various images on the big screen with the logistics staff. Suddenly, three screens went black. Everyone's expressions became serious when they saw this scene, and Ju Peter frowned, because this meant that the signal from the Den Den Mushi could not be transmitted through the dimensional gate. We have a problem. One of the remaining five elders who were in the room of the authority murmured. Warkuri crossed his hands and said in a deep voice, It seems that a dedicated person is needed to deliver the information. But in this way, we can't see the real-time picture of the other world. Nusjuro said while sighing. At this moment, a man wearing the protective suit walked out of the dimensional gate. He then said to the Den Den Mushi in his hand, Report, according to the test, the Den Den Mushi can be used normally on the other side. The air composition detection mission is in progress. Ju Peter nodded and said softly, In other words, the signal obstruction is only in that dimensional gate? Then try to connect the two ends directly. On the other side. Caesar was more intrigued by the environment around him than by the hustle and bustle around him. However, something seemed strange. Everything was too normal. Is this really another world? No matter how you look at it, it's just ordinary mountains, ordinary grass, ordinary sky, and ordinary sea. 1. Caesar looked at the sea in the distance with disappointment, and then walked to the researcher who was operating the detection equipment. Without asking anything, he lowered his head and reviewed the data himself. Oxygen levels are normal, and the composition of the air is similar. There are no unknown substances. It seems we don't need these protective suits. He reflected. Despite that, he did not dare to take it off and breathe deeply the air of this place. Hey, the compass can be used here, and it is very stable, which means there is no problem with the magnetism. Another researcher nearby said, looking at the ordinary compass in his hand. When Caesar heard this, he thought to himself that even if this was not another world, it should not be an island on the Grand Line, but somewhere in the Four Seas. Soon, the CP7 member who had returned to report the situation had returned holding a Den Den Mushi with a black cable attached, and this time, communication with the Cipher Paul headquarters on the other end was not cut off. We have achieved it. Ju Peter in the control room, the remaining five elders in the room of the authority, and even Imu in his tree house, were excited to see a clear image on the screen, accompanied by sounds of wind, waves, and insects sounds. Tisk, 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 I really didn't expect that the first person to enter the new world would be this kid Caesar. Imu sat on the sofa and chuckled. Although strictly speaking, Caesar was not the first person to enter the dimensional gate, but Imu only knew him, the others were unknown to him. Report, there is no problem with the air here. It is recommended to try taking off the protective clothing for testing, and further test the soil, trees, sea water, and collect plant and biological samples. Approved. Dash. Chapter 84, Chapter 84, Exploring the Unknown. The world seems to be at the turn of spring and summer, with the average temperature stabilizing between 21 degrees Celsius and 22 degrees Celsius, and lush trees, grassland, and rolling hills everywhere. About 300 meters away from the dimensional gate is a sea to the east. I don't know if this is the coast of the mainland or a small island in itself. At this time, tests have confirmed that they can breathe normally here. Caesar and others took off their heavy and stuffy protective suits and began to collect samples of the land, plants, insects, and even seawater. The members of CP7 also returned to their black attire, leaving three people to protect the detectors. The remaining three took the Den Den Mushi and quickly dispersed to the north, south and west. However, they had no intention of going too far away. They stopped their march almost a kilometer further on. Agents who explored to the west and south discovered an endless ocean in front of them, while to the north there were still steep hills and forests. All of this information was transmitted through the Den Den Mushi to the projection screens in the command center on the home world. 
surrounded by the sea on three sides, this should be a peninsula, but why is there no one there? Ju Peter shared his doubts through Den Den Mushi with the other five elders. Not only is there no one, but according to my observation, except for the birds flying by, there are no larger animals. Nusjuro adjusted his glasses as he spoke. The location is too remote, but this is a good thing for us. It gives us a lot more preparation time. Warkuri said in a deep voice. Then, let's set up surveillance Den Den Mushi around and, once the tests from the Biochemistry Research Institute are complete, let's send a part of the army and the construction department. A complete defensive base must be built around the dimensional gate in three days, and then as planned, we will send CP9 to explore more remote areas. At this time, Mars smiled and said, I don't know why, but I always feel a little disappointed. This other world looks too normal. Yes, indeed, if I didn't have 100% trust in Imasama, I might have doubts. Nusjuro nodded. In fact not only them, even Imu felt a little disappointed. If I hadn't firmly believed in the authenticity of this golden finger, I would have suspected that this dimensional gate is not connected to another world, but to somewhere in this world. Imu complained dissatisfiedly. Purupurupuru, Purupurupuru. While Imu was bored watching the projector, Den Den Mushi began to play. He then took the microphone and heard the voice on the other end. Imusama, Figarland Shanks, has escaped from the domain of the gods and defeated four patrolling guards. He informed the voice on the other end. Hearing this, Imu raised his eyebrows and thought to himself, as expected of Shanks, he would not just stay still. However, just as he was about to respond, he heard another report on the other end of the line. Imusama, we just received news that while Shanks was escaping, he encountered My Hawk and Jun, and now My Hawk is taking him back to the Figarland mansion in the domain of the gods. Imu didn't know what to say at that moment. He simply marveled at the strange coincidence, he hadn't yet instructed My Hawk to talk to Shanks, but the two had already met on their own accord. Understood. Having nothing else to say, Imu simply hung up the call. Domain of the Gods, Figarland Manor. Who the hell are you? Shanks glared at my hawk, who had brought him back. As for Jun, he went back by himself because he couldn't get in. My hawk found a chair, and sat down, then crossed his legs, and looked at the other party calmly and said, Dracul my hawk, a celestial dragon like you. Stop joking. No celestial dragon can be so strong. And I don't admit that I am a celestial dragon. You are not weak either. I saw how those guards were no match for you, but getting out of here is still far away. You didn't go more than 200 meters away and they already caught you. After finishing speaking, my hawk pointed to the chair opposite. Sit down first, how about we chat for a while? You. Shanks annoyed by my hawk's carefree attitude, gritted his teeth but had no choice but to sit down. He was no match for him in their previous confrontation. Hey, what do you want to talk about? Can you take me out of here after we finish talking? My hawk said softly, let's talk about the Roger Pirates, specifically the fencing styles of G.O.L.D. Roger and Silver's Rayleigh. And if I tell you, will you let me go? I cannot do it. Then why should I tell you something? Can I come here to spar with you from time to time, or do you prefer to be alone or socialize with other celestial dragons? Uh. Okay. September 15th, Mary G.O.S.A., the day the levely takes place. Kings from all over the world descended from their royal ships with some guards and gathered at the Red Port. For those experienced kings, the place was quite familiar and they maintained a calm and comfortable attitude. But for King Cobra and Princess Otohim, who came here for the first time, everything was completely new. What beautiful houses! Are these the cities of humans? Princess Otohim looked excitedly at the clean and tidy road in front of her and the brightly colored exquisite buildings on both sides. At this time, she noticed bubbles floating one after another from the grass under her feet. Are there bubbles here too? Odohim, 
our bubbles are made by us, and the bubbles here are made of yarakam and mangrove. Look at the two tall trees with big bubbles on their tops. King Neptune floated with bubbles around him as he spoke, pointing towards a distant place. While they were talking, the surrounding kings were also looking at Princess Otohim in surprise. Because the latter was not yet thirty years old, she still had her fish tail, although her long orange-yellow hair covered her very well. What a beautiful blonde mermaid! Are these King Neptune's family members? Even the young King Cobra took a few more glances from a distance. It was the first time in his life for him to see the giant fishman King Neptune or the mermaid Princess Otohim. Seeing this, Princess Otohim stood up generously and said with a gentle smile, Dear kings, I am the princess of Fishman Island, my name is Otohim. I look forward to working with you. Oh, she is the princess of the fishmen. No wonder she has such a charming aura. The kings suddenly realized. Just then, they noticed about fifteen individuals dressed in black coming towards them, some with denden mushi for live broadcasts and others with mini denden mushi for taking photos, dispersing around them and starting to work. What are you doing? Elizabello II of the Kingdom of Prodence asked curiously. Starting from this year's levely, the process and results will be announced to the outside world through live broadcast. For a time, the kings became confused and began to panic. You must know that they used to act recklessly at the conference table. It was basically normal to quarrel loudly and rudely, and it was common to curse each other. But now, for people around the world in front of the screen, this is another great entertainment program. Levely is something that everyone is paying attention to. In the past people could only understand the general situation of Levely through subsequent newspapers. Now, however, they could see the entire discussion of the kings on the levelly through the screen, it was just great. Room of the Authority Just when Mary Goa became lively, the five elders had no intention of paying attention to the levelly. Anyway, all the arrangements had been made. All the construction tools are too big to fit through the dimensional gate. This is delaying the construction of the base. Warkuri said seriously. There don't seem to be any dangerous people or creatures in that world. It just slows down the construction of the base. Nusjuro said calmly. Mars said, we might as well think about how we should make use of it if the opposite side is really a barbaric world without civilization. His words made the other four people think about it. Indeed, with the resources of an extra planet, how to make good use of them is the key. After a while, Warkuri was the first to speak. The first thing I think of is minerals, wood, food, livestock, and fresh water. In fact, there are not many material resources in the large and small kingdoms on Starfish, One Piece World. Many conflicts between countries stem from the competition for resources. This is very easy to understand. After all, this is a world where 90% of the area is occupied by the ocean, and each kingdom is located on an island facing the sea. Although there are many resources in the sea, the various huge and dangerous sea beasts in it, even the sea kings, are beyond the ability of these ordinary kingdoms to deal with. The fishermen are trembling with fear even when fishing in a boat. Coupled with chaotic magnetism and extremely volatile weather, transportation between countries is extremely inconvenient, making it even more difficult for this small amount of materials to circulate. For the world government, the scarcest resource is actually metal resources, especially iron and copper. This is actually one of the reasons why the Navy has always used breech-loading repeating flintlock muskets. Because the main body of this gun is 80% made of wood, only the barrel is made of iron and the bullets are made of copper. If all soldiers in the Navy and Army are to be equipped with automatic rifles, it can only be said that the world government has money, but even if it has money, it cannot buy so many materials. There are also Navy warships. Only the warships of the headquarters level will be covered with a layer of iron, while the warships of the marine branches are simply painted with a layer of blue paint. Therefore, if there is no civilization or dangers, I think we should quickly send the mining department to explore the mineral deposits and fresh water sources in that world. 
If we find enough iron and copper deposits, we won't need to buy materials from other kingdoms, we can simply mine them and build weapons factories. Dash. Chapter 85, Chapter 85, The Spiritual King's Speech The kings left their guards in the socializing plaza and continued to follow the officials in front to the round table council room. Ten minutes later. Wow! The next second after the official pushed the door open, all the viewers in front of the live broadcast subconsciously shouted in unison. The bright sunlight streaming in from the numerous windows brightly illuminated the room, revealing a round white table in the center, with fifty tall white and purple chairs arranged neatly three feet away behind the table. Considering that each king has a different body shape, the width of the chair is completely customized according to the size of each king. But the most eye-catching thing is the circular white platform with the huge emblem of the world government arranged inside the circular table. The entire stage exuded an invisible atmosphere of solemnity and gravity. This is where fifty kings discuss important matters. My God, this is too luxurious. When can I sit there? King Cobra, King Neptune, and others who were at the scene were also confused. Those who had not been here were just shocked, while those who had been were completely confused. What's going on? Why has the layout of the hall changed? Where's the big long table? King Arnold of the Drum Kingdom pointed inside and asked in surprise. The place where the levelly used to be held was a long table less than three meters wide but dozens of meters long. In fact, in the original timeline, this situation will continue for a long time, and it will not take the form of a large round table until more than twenty years later. Please take your seats according to the name plates on the table. Afterwards, the attendant will take away the name plates and bring you tea or coffee. After saying this, the official leading the way turned and left without any hesitation. The kings looked at each other, but immediately sprang into action, looking for their place. However, King Neptune didn't need to search, he just had to float to the largest chair and sit down. 1. Soon, the fifty kings were seated. The attendees respectfully served the drinks, removed the name tags from the table, and then quietly left the room. For a time, the whole atmosphere became very quiet. Actually, in the past, this moment would have been quite boisterous, with greetings between those with good relationships and sarcasm between those with tensions. But when they thought about the countless people looking at them, no one wanted to be the first to speak. Just then, the doors opened again, and Queen Odohim, dressed in a stunning long orange dress, carefully decorated, floated thanks to the bubbles to the large circular platform with the logo of the world government. Her long golden hair without a single discordant tone, combined with her big blue eyes and light pink lipstick, attracted amazement in everyone present. At that instant, except for King Neptune, the other forty-nine kings formed a large question mark above their heads, while the viewers watching the live broadcast were excited to see the legendary mermaid. Dear kings, royal families, nobles, commoners, and friends of all races watching the live broadcast, hello everyone, I am Queen Odohim of Fishman Island. After speaking, she bowed deeply, then slowly straightened up and continued. I very much appreciate the invitation of the world government to come and give a keynote speech at the Levely. The title of my speech is I Have a Dream. 1. For some reason, when Queen Odohim spoke, the already quiet conference room became even quieter, and the king's expressions seemed to relax. At the same time, the crowds in front of the screens also, little by little, stopped fussing, arguing and silently watched Queen Odohim on the screen. Finally, the whole world was ready to hear the speech. Once, we were classified as fish by humans and suffered discrimination at their hands. It was two hundred years ago that the great world government granted us Fishman Island, making us an affiliated nation and giving us the honor of attending the Levely. We believed that we could finally speak on equal terms with the best human kings. We believed that we had finally forged a friendship with the humans. But today, two hundred years later, we must face the unfortunate fact that fishmen still have no freedom, respect, or equality. Today, two hundred years later, 
under the oppression of racial segregation and discrimination, the lives of the fishmen are exploited. Today, 200 years later, the fishmen are still confined to a solitary island more than 10,000 meters under the sea, cowering in a corner of the ocean. Today we are gathered again with you, the kings, because the great world government has paid attention to us once again. It has radiated a bright light like a beacon and brought hope for the second time to us who have longed for freedom, sunshine, and forests for hundreds of years. They have noticed that fishmen continue to be brutally persecuted, captured, and sold by humans. They have noticed that the basic territory for fishmen is only the small fishman island, and they cannot even appear in the nearby Sabayati archipelago. Therefore, the great world government, again, with justice and equity, like the waves of the sea, approaches with strength and determination to wash away and break all the darkness towards the fishmen in the world. They have brought the declaration for the establishment of friendly and equal relations between humans and fishmen. And they have also introduced this year's theme, total prohibition of the slave trade and the comprehensive liberation of slaves in the world. Their arrival is like the dawn of joy, ending the long night of suffering for the fishmen and slaves. As the heartfelt speech progressed, Queen Odohim was completely emotional. The tone of every word she spoke, every movement of raising her hands, and even every change on her face were so irresistible. 1. At this time, the eyes of the fifty kings, including King Neptune, were surprisingly consistent, and they all showed empathetic expressions of shame, recognition, and apologies. They felt that they could truly feel the sincere emotions of Queen Odohim. This moment of strong emotional resonance became an invisible tide that silently washed everyone's minds through every sentence of her speech. Even those kings who were originally full of racial discrimination had their values unconsciously affected at this moment. Although the influence on the minds of the people in the various regions and distant kingdoms were less evident, men, women, young and old, human and non-human, all felt Queen Odohim's sincere compassion. Many people were even moved to tears by the misery of the fishmen. The content of the speech was actually not much, and it came to the end very quickly. In other words, the listeners who were paying full attention did not feel any time passing by. Everyone, I want to tell you today that in the present and in the future, although we have suffered all kinds of difficulties and setbacks, I still have a dream. This dream is deeply rooted in the dream of mankind and all races. I dream of a day when fishmen can truly stand in the world and live on equality with humans and all races. I dream that one day, fishmen can sit at the same table with humans in any sea area, any kingdom, and any island and share friendship. I have a dream that one day, the children of fishmen will live in a country where they will be judged not by their appearance, but by the quality of their character. The biggest obstacle to these dreams is the slave trade, which was explicitly banned hundreds of years ago but is still ignored or even accepted by default around the world. The world government is big and wants everyone to be equally big. The world government will realize all my dreams, let the voice of freedom ring with the wind of justice in the vast seas, in the seabed below 10,000 meters, in the sky above 10,000 meters, and let it ring in every the kingdom, every island even within everyone's ears. Now, please let the voice of freedom ring first on the top of the Red Earth continent, and please let the wind of justice blow first over this sacred holy land. Queen Odohim really poured all her passion, all her compassion, and all her sincerity into this speech, and used the highest stage of the levely to spread her influence to the greatest extent. In the treehouse, Imu also, like countless people, listened to the speech through the screens projected by the Denden Den Mushi. What a powerful Kanbuncho Kohaki! This spiritual wave is surprisingly subtle. It is difficult for an ordinary Kanbuncho Kohaki user to detect. Imu knew that Queen Odohim was a natural awakener of advanced Kanbuncho Kohaki. Furthermore, she had a variety of special abilities. She could hear the inner voices of others, sense their thoughts and emotions, and transmit her will through words and sound into the minds of others. She can also influence the minds and thoughts of others and resonate strongly. When her emotions reach their extreme, she can even change other people's values and ideologies. But the premise is that every word she says is an idea that she believes from the bottom of her heart. 
just saying a few words will not work. Then what is this called? Strategic nuclear weapons at the spiritual level. According to the style of this world, he can be called the spiritual king. However, Imu can also feel that Queen Odohim's ability is limited to a certain range, or that the mental fluctuations she emits have the strongest effect within a hundred meters. The way he spread his speech through the Denden Mushi made these mental fluctuations quite weak. However, they induced people to listen to her carefully and understand her emotions a little subconsciously. But the effect on the mind and consciousness of people with similar mental strength or strong will as hers was not as effective. But even so, Imu feels that as long as it is used properly, it can have a miraculous effect, which is comparable to the awakening ability of a devil fruit. This is why he made an exception and appointed Queen Odohim to give a speech to the world. As long as she firmly believes that the world government is just, we only need to spend some time arranging a lecture tour for her, and she will be able to support the support of the people wherever she goes. At this moment, Imu finally found the greatest value of Fishman Island, which is Queen Odohim herself. While Imu finished analyzing the value of Queen Odohim's ability, she took the receiver of the Denden Den Mushi and dialed a number. Imu Sama. Place Queen Odohim as a maximum level cipher Paul protection target. She further notifies the Drum Kingdom Medical College to send a medical team to Fishman Island. They must strengthen her fragile constitution and ensure her health. I don't want her to suffer any mishaps in the future. Dash. Chapter 86, Chapter 86, Crocodile's Unexpected Inclusion Princess Odohim's speech unleashed a stir that swept all seas, but the external impact paled in comparison to what it caused in the round table council room. No surprises, under the direct influence of Princess Odohim, all the kings immediately signed the declaration of equality and friendship between humans and the fishman races. And in the next session, the total prohibition of the slave trade and the total liberation of slaves in the world was unanimously approved. This was the fearsome power of the spiritual king. As long as the princess spoke sincerely and the listeners were close enough to her to hear her completely without being able to resist her spirit and will, regardless of her previous beliefs, they would completely accept her ideas. The unanimous approval of the resolution, combined with the live broadcast, had a shocking effect. Especially in the kingdoms of the fifty kings, the nobles and internal officials immediately freed the slaves by removing their explosive collars. They were also moved by the speech. Even if they did not change their convictions and ideas, they were moved at that moment. The world government designated that day as Liberation Day, establishing it as a holiday in all affiliated nations. After the levelly, Princess Odohim returned to Fishman Island protected by CP7 agents and treated by Drum Kingdom doctors due to her fragile health. King Neptune was very confused by this situation. He didn't believe that just one speech required so much attention. But in the end he could only accept the situation since the world government did not give them a choice and only informed them about it. This is because Imu did not allow Princess Odohim to be informed about her advanced Kanbunsho Kohaki, as she might believe that the world government was using it which could cause her ability to not work properly. Dusk was approaching, the sky was darkening, and the flames of twilight were gathering, covering half the horizon. Although night had not completely fallen, the moon was already shining overhead, observing everything from above. The docks in District GR70 of the Sabayati Archipelago were packed. Ships with royal flags occupied most of them, even forcing others to seek space in adjacent areas. The Sabayati archipelago was experiencing a feeling of maritime congestion, with ships circling the island. The streets were packed with people enjoying the place of bubbles and fantasy. The once dangerous area, from GR1 to GR29, under the control of the navy led by Dragon, is now a safe district and commercial zone, expanding the space for visitors. Liberation Night is an event organized by the Propaganda Department to celebrate the abolition of the slave trade and unite the local inhabitants of the Sabayati Archipelago with the inhabitants of Fishman Island in a party that seeks to strengthen their ties. Which will be transmitted through Denden Mushi to the whole world. Pangea Castle, Socializing Plaza
My hawk hasn't arrived yet. The live broadcast will start soon. Jun stood there, staring in the direction of the castle gate and asked anxiously. Stussy stood behind Imu in a lively manner and said with a smile, I must be practicing swordsmanship with Saint Figarland Shanks. Maybe he lost track of time. Humph, he can only train with me for an hour every day and spends the rest of the time with Shanks. It's really too much. Jun said angrily. But she was very curious. Apart from my hawk, were there really any celestial dragons with superb swordsmanship? Suddenly, Jun's eyes lit up. Hey, we're here. Imu, sitting in his chair, reflects on my hawk's late arrival and the unexpected appearance of Shanks, the young apprentice of Roger's old crew. My hawk approached Imu, then lowered his head and said respectfully, Sir. Shanks is the only one in your family and is not willing to go to other mansions of the Figarland family. I invited him as a friend. Imu was speechless as he thought. What is this, my son brings his classmates to play at home. Imu looked into Shanks' eyes. The latter only lasted for two seconds before subconsciously avoiding his gaze and his body became tense. But he still took off the straw hat on his head, bowed politely and said, Well. You are the godfather my hawk often mentioned, right? My name is Shanks, sorry to bother you. Um. Imu looked meaningfully at the straw hat in his hand and ordered the maid not far away, bring another chair. Yes, sir. The maid left quickly. Seeing this, my hawk was relieved of his nervousness. Despite his cool face on the surface, he was really not sure whether Imu would accept Shanks. The reason why he values Shanks so much is because Shanks is a rare celestial dragon who can talk to him and is also very powerful. Thanks. After Shanks thanked the maid, he heard Imu's voice. Your experience is very dramatic. You must have experienced many things with the Roger Pirates. This is indeed a precious treasure in life, but now that you know your identity, you should make your position clear. The past is hidden deep in your heart. Just remember it, but don't let it affect your judgment now and in the future. Everyone present knew Shanks origins, and naturally understood the meaning of Imu's words. Shanks lowered his eyes, pursed his lips, and listened in silence. You have to understand that the reason why you were adopted by Roger was not because your parents abandoned you, but because your parents died at the hands of the Rocks Pirates. The Pirates killed your parents, and the pirates also raised you. From this point of view, you and the pirates can be said to have nothing to do with each other. Accept the fact that you are a celestial dragon and live a good life. One day you will be proud of this identity and realize how insignificant the so-called Roger pirates are. I... As soon as Imu finished speaking, and when Shanks was about to answer, cheerful, fast-paced music suddenly started to sound and then the stage curtain in the projection screen slowly opened. This forced Shanks to hold back his words and watch in disbelief as Imu completely ignored him, focusing on the image on the screen. Feeling unable to articulate a word after listening to the other for so long was extremely uncomfortable for Shanks. Then everyone began to watch the massive entertainment event, where the main characters of the show are Tesoro and Stella. While the outside world celebrated Liberation Day amidst a festive atmosphere of music and dance. Inside Impel Down, apart from the jailers who were secretly watching the performance from their rooms, the prisoners at all levels were still full of desperate screams and wails. Several people were dying in various circumstances at any one time. In a cell in the Eternal Hell, Crocodile, who was sitting with his eyes closed and concentrating, instantly opened his somewhat numb eyes. When he saw the cell door rising slowly, his pupils suddenly shrank, and a flame called hope automatically ignited in his heart. Crocodile, come out. Outside the cell, Magellan looked at Crocodile coldly. Crocodile slowly stood up and asked unhurriedly, Can you tell me where I'm going? You can ask the person who picks you up outside. I'm only responsible for taking you out. Yet. Yeah. Crocodile no longer hesitated and walked over decisively. Even if he had to be taken out for execution now, 
he would rather die in the sunshine outside than slowly rot in this dark cell. Looks like my wheel of fortune is turning again. Crocodile approached Magellan with a mocking smile, then began his characteristic and unique long laugh. Quahahaha! Shut up! Magellan frowned, unable to bear that breathless and panting laughter, angrily shouted at him, If you laugh again, your destiny will stop right here. Tesoro and Stella's performance lasted two hours, where they sang more than a dozen songs. Despite the closure of the party, the festive atmosphere at the Sabayati archipelago was still intact. The crowd spread across the island, filling bars and restaurants to capacity. Meanwhile at the marine base of the Sabayati archipelago, Dragon in his office listened to Rear Admiral Irwin's report, as he lamented about the security problems and the challenges of maintaining order between humans and fishmen. Just at that moment Dragon, who was using the powers of his devil fruit in conjunction with his Kanbunsho Kohaki to monitor the Sabayati archipelago, detected an individual alone in the GR53 area, an expert with an imposing presence. Area RL1556, Red Earth Continent. What are they saying? A sharp voice, almost an ear-piercing scream, echoed through the base of dimensional gate number 0001, piercing even the closed electric gates. Caesar Clown was very angry at this time, very angry. He was so angry that he gritted his teeth and his chest heaved rapidly, especially his brown eyes, which glared viciously at the government personnel who came to deliver the message. I have just contacted another world and we are about to begin a deep exploration. And now they ask me to return to Impel Down. The officer reminded him that, at 16 years old and only a student at the Academy of Biochemical Sciences, he did not qualify to continue further. In his place, Professor Fritz would take charge. Caesar resisted, refusing to return, but the officer delivered one more message, if he investigated the viruses presented to him in the report and cured Amber Lead Syndrome, he would be the next director of the academy and lead a crucial mission for the world government. After speaking, the man turned and left without another word leaving Caesar standing there struggling, hesitating, frustrated, and finally followed him with a long sigh. After Caesar left the outermost door of the base quickly opened on both sides after a few beeps, and then ten men and women in black suits appeared in front of everyone. With a quick glance, one could see that there were five men and five women. They were the CP9 special team. Nine of them were lined up behind a silver-haired man wearing blue diamond earrings and dark red glasses. Captain Lasky, this way, please. I will guide each of you to your rooms and explain the details of the mission. The officer said he had previously tried to dissuade Caesar Clown. Lead the way. Lasky raised his chin slightly in response and walked forward with a firm step, without showing the slightest discomfort at being in an unfamiliar place. However, his sharp eyes, hidden behind the dark red glasses, quickly scanned the surroundings and the arrangement of the people. But just as CP9 was halfway there, a new set of beeps sounded behind them. The doors opened again, stopping Lasky, who turned to look. The nine members behind him quickly separated so that his view would not be obstructed. Quahahahaha! With the appearance of a man with a height of eight feet, carrying a black coat over his shoulders, a loud and annoying laughter began that spread throughout the base. Although I don't know why they need me, this place is nice. I like it, can I at least take a hot bath here? Crocodile. A member of CP9 whispered the person's identity. At this moment, the officer leading the way reminded them expressionlessly. Crocodile will go to the same mission area with you. You can communicate with each other later. What? The CP9 members exclaimed, even Lasky frowned slightly. What is our task this time and why do we need the help of a pirate? The details of the mission will be explained later, but I need to correct you. Mr. Crocodile is not here to assist you. He will just go to the same area at the same time as you. Lasky nodded and said coldly, continue to guide us. Okay. As they walked, Crocodile's gaze fell on the members of CP9, as their presence was the strongest in the place. Especially that stinky guy wearing blue diamond earrings, 
judging from his breath alone, he is no weaker than himself now. Ten minutes later. The CP9 members confirmed their respective rooms and then gathered in a large living room, sitting on sofas arranged around them. In front of them were coffee, red wine, tea and other drinks freshly served by a waiter. Say it. Lasky gently picked up the glass and shook the whiskey mixed with ice cubes. Well, for a better understanding, please take a look at these reports. Said a government official in charge of the site, personally handing out ten reports to each member of CP9. Lasky was the first to receive them. As he leafed through them in silence, his expression became increasingly tense, his eyes showing intense emotion. This time your mission is to enter another world, detect all the information useful to the world government and send the information back to this base at any cost. To be honest, not only him, but all CP9 members were also shocked. If there were no problems where they were, they would have doubted whether this person was joking with them. But Lasky immediately calmed down and continued reading. According to what is written above, no dangerous creatures or abnormal conditions were found within 500 meters of the entrance called the Dimensional Gate. This took a weight off their shoulders. But the most crucial information was about the successful communication test using Denden Mushi in the other world. This would be of great help to them. I assume you have all finished reading the reports. You will form five groups. When you cross to the other side of the gate, you will disperse in different directions. If you encounter strange creatures or intelligent beings, please contact the base under the premise of maintaining your safety. The official explained. As for supplies and equipment, what can we bring? Lasky asked expressionlessly. Five days worth of compressed food rations and three days worth of water. You may also carry an automatic pistol with five magazines, five grenades, a compass and a melee weapon of your choice. Daggers two per person. Lasky responded without consulting the other members, who also raised no objections. Okay. Now can you tell me why Crocodile went in with us? Dash. Chapter 87, Chapter 87, Worlds Beyond, CP9S Investigation Commences. Mary Gosa, Peng Dia Castle, Room of the Authority. The five elders gathered together again and watched the projection screen broadcast from the Cypher Paul headquarters. This time, Ju Peter was not present to direct personally, as the importance of the first contact with a new world had justified it before. Now, command responsibility would return to CP0. CP0, known as the Celestial Dragon's strongest shield, handle top secret missions, with the authority to eliminate anyone who hinders their duties including Navy officers and nobles. At a hierarchical level, they were the highest authority within the Cypher Paul organization, with the power to assign personnel from CP1 to CP9. Finally, we are going to begin the in-depth investigation. I am eager and hope that enough surprises await us. Warkuri expressed. Yes, it would be boring if it were a primitive world without civilization. Saturn laughed. Venus Juro said seriously, Imusama said that there will be more dimensional gates in the future, some leading to civilized worlds. We must worry about facing an enemy with too much power, if they penetrate our defenses, it will be a real disaster. Then we can only ask Imusama to close the dimensional gate. Ju Peter said coldly, not caring at all about the personnel of various ministries who may also be imprisoned in another world. In his opinion, Sacrifice is inevitable. Let's start. At this moment, Mars, who had been silent the entire time, pointed to the projection. The other four five elders stopped talking and paid attention. Area no. RL1556. Lasky and the CP9 team, along with Crocodile, were standing in an isolation chamber in front of the first electric door. Both sides showed no intention of communicating. Everyone, please enter the disinfection chamber. A voice sounded through the speaker. The door in front of them opened slowly, and without saying a word, everyone obeyed and entered. A second silver-colored airtight door appeared in front of them, as the previous door closed. 
The next moment, the lamps hanging on the surrounding walls lit up with purple light, and at the same time, a somewhat pungent white spray poured in along the pipes. Soon, everyone was completely disinfected. Disinfection completed, I wish you all a smooth mission and a safe return. The voice came through the speaker again. Then, the electric gate in front of them slowly opened and what came into view was an energy gate that was close to the ground and glowing with blue light at the edge. Through this door, one could glimpse a silver room on the other side. The CP9 and Crocodile continued to advance without saying a word and entered the dimensional gate one by one. As expected, the room here was identical to the other side, as if it were a perfect reflection, a disinfection chamber, an isolation chamber. When the last door opened, they found wooden barracks and patrolling soldiers, occasionally figures dressed in white and dark suits passed by. The sky here is blue too. It doesn't seem like a different world at all. A CP9 agent commented as he observed the sky. I will give you ten minutes to familiarize yourself with this base. In ten minutes, gather outside the base gate and prepare to leave. Lasky ordered coldly. Yes, Captain. The CP9 agents quickly dispersed, leaving only Crocodile looking around. He hadn't been given a specific task, he was just told to explore as he pleased. However, if he did not return to the base within a month, the world government would deny him entry to the starfish world. In short, he would be forced to spend the rest of his life in this unknown world. But if he decided to return, it meant that he would be willing to unite under the banner of the world government. Yeah, no matter how you look at it, it's better to take a look. A new world sounds pretty interesting. In the next instant, with a cold smile, he turned into a gust of wind and sand, before rushing out of the base, attracting the attention of many along his path. Crocodile's actions were seen by the five elders. Use the new world as bait to attract these unruly types. Once they personally experience a completely new world, it will be difficult to resist more in the future. Venus Juro nodded in agreement, according to Imusama, the entire universe is a vast, limitless ocean, each world is like an island. People like Crocodile will never be content to stay on a single island. Betting on him is the right decision. Yes, it seems that your army will soon have one more recruit. However, I believe that this method is not only useful for Crocodile but can also be used to recruit other people. The worlds mentioned by Imusama are really full of temptations and full of possibilities. Mars sighed. At the same time, in the world of Dimensional Gate No. 0001, in front of the base, ten black-robed men and women gathered again. Lasky glanced at the team members in front of him coolly and ordered, according to the assignments and directions discussed above, go ahead. Yes. Several swish-swish sounds suddenly sounded in the air, and the eight members turned into black afterimages and shot out. Only his partner remained in place. Let's go, the mission begins. Looking at his partner, Lasky's voice seemed a little softer than usual. The sharp gleam in his eyes softened as he met her face. Yet. Yeah. Marta, Khalifa's mother and Lasky's wife, was an elegant woman, with white skin and soft blonde hair, and also Lasky's companion on this mission. 1. The two of them moved quickly towards the northwest. The Kanbuncho Kohaki allowed them to detect presences without fear of being surprised, even hundreds of meters away. However, after traveling almost two kilometers, they had not found any strange creatures or notable situations. Is this really an uninhabited world? Marta stopped her pace, adjusting her labored breathing as she asked. Instead, I wonder if this is just an island or an entire continent. As for intelligent civilization, isn't it a good thing? It saves a lot of trouble. Lasky, without showing fatigue, observed the surroundings, a typical mountainous region with hills of two to five hundred meters and a dense forest cover. Poraporu, Poraporu. Suddenly, the little Denden den mushy in his pocket started ringing. Pulling it out and holding up the receiver, Lasky responded, What's wrong? This is the dimensional gate base No. 0001. 
Team 3 just found two strange human corpses with black and purple skin in the north, 2.5 kilometers from the base. We confirm the existence of a human civilization in this world. Please proceed with caution. After hearing this, Lasky and Marta looked at each other in surprise, there really are people in this world. Understood. Putting away the device, Lasky pondered for a moment before saying, We'll slow down. It shouldn't take long to meet the people here. Okay. Marta nodded. Meanwhile, at the New World base, the news caused a stir. Send a mobile unit immediately to bring the bodies back. Inform Professor Fritz to be ready in the operating room. We will begin the autopsy as soon as the bodies arrive. Understood. Soon, a group of twenty soldiers on motorcycles came noisily out of the base gate, raising a large cloud of dust behind them. The dimensional gate is wide enough to bring in these motorcycles. On the other hand, the five elders who received the news were also very surprised. In fact, there is civilization in this world, and judging from the images transmitted, they are basically normal human beings. But what did they die from, and why are they in this state? Warkuri looked at the projection screen in confusion. On the screen you could see two corpses lying on the ground full of weeds. The strange thing was that his skin looked black and purple, and the eyes were completely black and basically it's hard to see the pupils. It could be poisoning. Jew Peter expressed his first feelings. Poisoning. The other four people looked at each other and frowned in thought. Jew Peter continued to observe the projection, although his clothes are almost completely destroyed, the remains that remain resemble the clothing of Wayno country. Mars stroked his prominent beard and said, if it is poisoning, both of them must have been affected by the same poison. We must consider whether this poison is still present in the bodies, in addition to discovering how it spreads and its characteristics. Professor Fritz must examine them before knowing more. Warkuri nodded, and said with relief, Fortunately, we have prepared a complete biosafety station. Otherwise, it would be risky to allow people to easily come and go from the other world. Let's hope. I trust that the other CP9 teams will make new discoveries soon. Jew Peter smiled, he had a lot of confidence in the ten people he selected. About two hours later, the dispatched mobile unit returned to the base in the New World with two body bags and handed them over to the waiting researchers from the Biochemical Research Institute. As for CP9 Team 3, they continued to explore further. In the relatively simple operating room, Professor Fritz, who had already changed into chemical protective clothing for surgery, raised his hands in front of him, and looked at the body on the operating table and let out a long sigh. Not far away, outside the glass window, stood three government officials in black suits. Everyone had the same indifference on their faces, just watching the situation in the operating room quietly. At this moment, Professor Fritz skillfully handled the sharp scalpel to open the body of the deceased. Um. At that precise moment, he felt a heat transmit through his gloves. Surprised, he commented, pretty high internal temperature. He could clearly see the steam emanating from the corpse's organs, as if they were being steamed. He fixed his gaze on the left side of his chest. The heart position. That area had a noticeably darker color, as if it had been burned at high temperatures. However, just as the scalpel approached to examine the heart, something unexpected happened. 1. He did not scratch hard, and the thin black skin on the surface was easily cut open, but just when the blade was about to penetrate further. Suddenly, a crisp sound sounded in the operating room. The sound was like a sharp blade touching glass, but the glass was obviously very hard. Even if Professor Fritz subconsciously increased his strength, he still couldn't cut through the somewhat transparent thin skin. How is it possible? The surprise in Professor Fritz's eyes turned to amazement. It was unthinkable that there was a part of the human body that could be so hard. At this moment, his earpiece inside the protective suit issued a voice. Professor, we found some kind of infectious virus on the other corpse, and it has basically been determined to be an RNA virus. Through experiments on impel-down prisoners, 
we have determined that it is transmitted through blood, saliva, and wounds. Once inside the body, the virus accumulates in the aorta and then spreads from the heart to the brain, turning the victim into a mindless but mobile being, an undead. Meanwhile, in a holding cell inside the base, accompanied by two black-clad individuals from CP7, a bare-chested prisoner wearing the striped uniform of Impel Down. He had purple and black skin, his veins seemed to glow a molten yellow and his eyes turned black to the point where only his pupils took on a menacing red glow. Additionally, on his chest you can see a burning red light at the location of his heart. Several researchers from the Institute of Biochemistry, dressed in biochemical safety suits, observed the prisoner's situation and reported to Professor Fritz through the headset. They just applied the virus collected from the second corpse to the wound on the prisoner's arm, and then witnessed with their own eyes his transformation from a normal person to what he is now. The whole process took less than a minute. We request to carry out attack tests on it. Professor Fritz was surprised, undead? But he quickly restrained his emotions and looked at the open body in front of him, saying, OK, but keep a safe distance. This task is left to CP7 and the army. Understood. Dash. Chapter 88, Chapter 88, Cabane World. 6. The researchers who had just received Professor Fritz's response, addressed the two CP7 members in front of them. The request for assault testing has been approved. The latter looked at each other, and one of them asked, should we ask the headquarters if they will send more testing personnel or if we will do it? Yet. Yeah. The other person nodded, and then contacted his boss through the headset hanging on his collar. Professor Fritz is the director of the Institute of Biochemistry, so his permission has no meaning to these two CP7S unless these researchers want to go up and test it in person. However, their mission is to protect these scientific researchers, so it is impossible for them to allow them to do so. Soon, the two men received orders to directly test the aggressiveness and combat effectiveness of the undead. Meanwhile, outside the cell, two layers of army troops were holding automatic rifles and even rocket launchers. Leave someone to observe, the other researchers go out first. We wouldn't be able to handle it if something goes wrong. Said one of the CP7 members. Okay. I'll stay, and the others will get out. The researcher who had contacted Professor Fritz made the decision immediately, being the leader of the research group and with the authority to give orders. Soon, in the dark hallway that led to the cell, only the three of them remained. I'll go, you stay here with him. Okay. After a brief communication, the tallest CP7 member moved, stretching his neck and shoulders before moving forward while the other stepped back with the researcher. At the same time, the surveillance den den mushy on the wall was broadcasting everything that was happening. Ugh! When footsteps suddenly echoed, the undead, with a glow on its chest, sharply turned its head, its eyes also glowing brightly, giving off an eerie feeling. When the figure of the man in black appeared outside the cell, the originally calm expression on the undead's face suddenly became fierce. He was seen with his bloody mouth open, waving his dark arms and claws, letting out a bloodthirsty roar as he rushed forward crazily, and then hit the steel railing with a clang. Um. But just such a collision immediately shocked the man in black outside and the two people observing not far away, because the railing was bent directly. Although the prison railings are not made of sea stone, they are still made of steel. Oh, it seems like this little guy has strength. The CP7 member in charge of the test said, showing a mocking smile. He did not rush to act, he wanted to see if the undead could free itself. Roar! The undead seemed to have been provoked by these words. Grabbing the nearby bars, he began to pull hard, creating a gap large enough to pass through, and then, with his fingers turned into claws, he pounced like a wild beast. Ha <laughs> ha! The CP7 member simply dodged the attacks, without returning any. He remained in place, skillfully dodging all of the undead's attacks, as if it were easy, while making comments. It has strength, but it is slow and clearly lacks brains. It is not even as cunning as a common animal, 
just a being controlled by the hunting instinct. While dodging, he shared his opinion, as a reference for nearby investigators. Then he asked, You said before that the infection root of this virus is through wounds, right, so as long as there are no wounds, it's okay. Yes. The researcher who was hiding behind the CP7 member nodded nervously. That's okay, let's test the power of this thing. The man in black licked his lips and suddenly stopped moving, allowing the undead to pounce on him and bite him. Tekai. With a light scream, his body tensed to the maximum, the undead tore his suit and shirt, but could not break his skin. His nails and teeth were useless, the undead, furious, began to hit the black-clad individual's chest. Bang! 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 The hallway echoed with dull thuds, but the CP7 member's feet were firmly planted on the ground, not moving a step back from the undead's attacks. Finally, somewhat impatiently, he kicked the undead's abdomen, making him retreat and crash against the bars, and then against the wall of the cell. How about it? The CP7 member who was protecting the scientific researcher asked. The power of the fist is about 300. No wonder it can bend the railing easily. I just don't know if its kind has this kind of power. Hearing this answer, the researcher was thinking and said, judging from its actions just now, it seems that it has lifted the instinctive limitations of the human body, so it has such great power. But this test subject is a prisoner from our world. To understand the average strength of this world's undead, we would need to test someone from here or find an undead. As they argued, the undead fell from the wall, its abdomen sagging, but it seemed unaffected as it stood up again. Attack his heart, the glowing spot on his chest. The researcher recalled out loud. Understood. The man in black in charge of the test looked at the tattered clothes on his body unhappily, and his eyes turned cold when he looked at the undead. Shigan. He concentrated all his strength on his right index finger, approached within about two meters of the undead, and in a flash, accurately shot at the glow shining on the left side of the undead's chest. Soru. Instantly, after carrying out the attack, the CP7 member disappeared from the scene, dodging the desperate attack of the undead and reappeared ten meters away. Meanwhile, the undead, looking at his exposed heart, then roared furiously and lunged towards the CP7 member again. The latter's face became gloomy upon seeing this. Didn't your finger gun penetrate its heart? Or is it still alive even if its heart was penetrated? The CP7 member, who was protecting the researcher not far away, asked. No, the feel of my fingers tells me that the Shigan only pierced the superficial skin of his chest, so his heart is intact. Said the CP7 member in charge of the test. He didn't expect the skin on the being's chest to be so tough, upon receiving the impact of the Shigan, he felt as hard as steel. In that case, try again. The CP7 member declared with determination. He disappeared once more and, like a shadow, passed by the lunging undead. In the next instant, the undead let out a piercing scream as it fell to the ground behind him, unable to get up. The heart is extremely hot. The CP7 member said as he drilled again in the same place as before. Finally, he managed to pierce the undead's heart, but his index finger was burned by the sudden heat. The man in black guarding the scientific researcher came over and asked, How about it? You should know that although the Shigan is said to be as powerful as bullets, in fact, the penetrating power of the Shigan is much greater than that of ordinary bullets, and it can easily penetrate the human body and even steel. However, even with that, a single blow only pierced the superficial skin on his chest. To kill him, we would have to attack the same place again. After saying that, the CP7 member in charge of the test shook his head, smiled bitterly and said, Of course, it could also be me. I haven't practiced enough and I'm not very skilled in using Shigan. Mary Giosa, Pangea Castle, Between the Moon. Imu, at this moment saw the entire process through holographic transmission. This form of zombie looks like Cabane, with its glowing pupils, heart and hard heart membrane. 
He watched several scientists on the screen who were putting the completely dead prisoner Cabane into a body bag, falling into deep thought. I traveled to the world of One Piece, and now the dimensional gate is connected to another anime world. Imu closed his eyes and began to search for various information deep in his memory. This anime was popular at the time, and of course, I had seen it. Although it had been quite a while, fortunately, his mental power surpassed that of the average person. Although he didn't reach the level of a biological computer or having a memory palace, searching through his memories wouldn't be a problem. Cabane, Kabaneri. About half an hour later, Imu slowly opened his eyes. At that time, he already had a clearer understanding of the world of Cabane, but after careful consideration, he decided not to reveal it to the five elders and others prematurely. There will be more worlds connected by the dimensional gates in the future. The world government would have to figure out for itself how to approach a new world. This world of Cabane did not seem particularly dangerous, it would be a good training ground for them to practice. Then is there anything in this world that is useful to me? In fact, Imu had been thinking lately about whether his power could advance further. Despite being considered one of the strongest in the world of One Piece, he knew that in the vast multiverse it was no big deal. Imu thought for a while, and finally shook his head. The things in this Cabane world, whether it was the Cabane virus or the Kabaneri made by injecting the black blood, were of no use to him. He was not someone willing to become a monster just for power. Furthermore, since the worlds connected by the dimensional gates would probably be anime worlds, he would surely find something that would strengthen his power more appropriately. He wasn't in a hurry. He would take things slow. But the special resources of this world are a bit interesting. Imu rubbed his chin, thinking. Whether it's Cabane's heart membrane or the special high-pressure steam weapon called Tsurunuki Zutsu, they are all things that can be mass-produced. Of course, the former can be regarded as either a non-renewable resource or a renewable resource, depending on the angle from which it is viewed. Cabane World base of the dimensional gate. Professor Fritz in the operating room, after listening to the detailed report over the earpiece, looked at the open corpse in front of him, deep in thought. This puzzled his assistant, who asked in perplexity, Professor. You just heard what was said there, right? Yeah. So, if these undead only die when their heart is pierced, how did this one in front of us die? The assistant was puzzled then stared at the body where the heart membrane was intact, feeling an inexplicable chill. It means that. I'm thinking maybe he's not dead yet. Professor Fritz's words left the assistant pale. He had heard how terrifying the power of these undead was. They could bend steel with ease and a wound from them meant being infected and becoming one of them. Thinking of this, the assistant quickly backed away. Meanwhile, Professor Fritz continued thoughtfully, expressing his thoughts. I'm wondering if it has entered a dormant state because it hasn't eaten for a long time. So as long as we find the food it needs, we could make him wake up again. But, Professor, why do we need to wake it up? The assistant asked with fear. Because we need to understand its bodily functions. There are no living subjects to observe and experiment with, so let's try to wake it up but we could use prisoners to create living subjects. What if the bodies of people in our world are different from those of people in this world? Professor Fritz asked, leaving the assistant speechless. About its food, according to reports, it seems that it likes to bite people. So, what there is in humans that could be its food would be flesh and blood. With this said, the professor showed surprising surgical skill and dexterity in closing the abdomen of the body again. After finishing the operation quickly, he immediately put down the scalpel and walked out of the operating room. The assistant quickly followed him. He didn't want to stay in this operating room anymore. Please bring three bags of human blood and some human flesh, and then send someone to pour them into the abdominal cavity of the corpse inside. Please note that it is likely to wake up again, and please be careful about its bite. Okay, we'll arrange the personnel right away. 
the CP7 in charge of security nodded and began to communicate Professor Fritz's request to his superiors. They were very efficient. They brought the test materials in just 10 minutes, and then two men in black walked into the operating room and started the operation. Professor Fritz and the assistant watched every move inside. One of the men in black tore open the first blood bag, then pinched the corpse's jaw open with his left hand and poured the scarlet human blood into his mouth with his right hand. After seeing that there was no reaction, he prepared to take the meat from the box. But at that moment, the body on the stretcher suddenly opened its eyes, burning like flames, and he rushed towards one of the men in black who was next to him. Be careful. The face of the man in black on the other side changed drastically. With a quick and explosive movement of his arm. He punched the undead in the cheek and buried his entire head in the operating bed. After the commotion, the other man in black instantly disappeared from the scene, only to reappear in a corner of the room, looking with disgust at the undead that was trying to remove its head from the stretcher. Isn't he dead yet? The CP7 who launched the attack was very surprised. A blow with that power to a normal person's head should have left an internal mess. Roar. Finally, the undead managed to pull its head out, but it was evidently sunken in on one side, with one dark eye protruding. However, he was not dead. He seemed more enraged than ever and lunged at the man in black who had hit him. Professor Fritz, do you want to kill it? The man in black used the Kami E to easily dodge the undead's attacks and asked loudly towards the outside of the operating room. Try its power first, and then attack its heart to see how it is different from the undead prisoner before. After his guess was confirmed to be correct, Professor Fritz looked very excited at this time. We still have another undead from this world for further examination. Understood. The man in black stopped the undead's frantic attacks using the Tekai and then pierced its heart using the Shigen. When he withdrew his finger, looking at the fallen undead in front of him, his face was full of bewilderment. What's going on? His power level doesn't even reach a hundred, and that heart skin, although it's hard like a layer of steel, can't stop the Shigen at all. Isn't that Gus guy too weak? He had to perform two attacks before he could kill the undead. 2. Dash. Chapter 89, Chapter 89, Virus, Undead and Speculations In the office the two leaders of the research team were excited as they watched Professor Fritz read the test reports they had just submitted. It's incredible. The total number of human cells in this world is only about 40 trillion. There are only 4,000 to 5,000 white blood cells in one cubic millimeter of blood which means that the self-healing mechanism and immune system are very fragile. You can imagine that they are easily sick and have poor physical fitness. After hearing what team leader Ron said, team leader Eli nodded in agreement and said, it is true that people in our world, even a 10-year-old child, are much stronger than the adults here. Professor Fritz finished reading the two reports, removed his glasses from the bridge of his nose, and looked at them seriously. The expressions of the two people seemed to look down on the humans of this world to some extent. We can't draw such quick conclusions. We only have two test subjects for now, which is not representative. We can't say for sure if they are the norm or the exception, much less know if there are stronger humans. Just like you and me, although we are part of the majority, I believe you also know how many people or races there are that are several times, even ten times or hundreds of times stronger than us. Leaders Eli and Ron were stunned for a moment, and then they realized that this was indeed the case. God knows if there are any foreigners or people with extraordinary talents similar to the fishmen and giants in this world. Yes, we have been hasty in our conclusions. Ron apologized shamefully. Well, our focus now should be on this virus. The more I look at it, the more interesting it becomes. Professor Fritz said before pointing to one of the reports. According to experiments, this is a virus that mainly infects the blood. After entering the body through wounds, it will quickly invade the blood vessels, and at the same time cause the infected plasma and blood cells to rapidly heat up, reaching a high temperature close to boiling water. 
such a high temperature will of course burn the surrounding tissues. The external manifestation is that the skin turns black and purple, and the blood in the blood vessels produces a flame-like red light due to excessive thermal radiation. When the virus invades the heart through blood vessels, it can transmit the virus to all blood vessels, including the brain. However, the brain can hardly withstand such high temperatures, which will lead to brain death, leaving only the instinct, activity and bloodlust that the virus needs and pursues. The two team leaders listened silently as they reflected. Team leader Ron sighed. What a terrible virus. I can only say that this world is truly full of wonders. I just talked about the essence of this virus, now let's talk about the function of this virus. Professor Fritz's mood was a little complicated at this time, because he knew that this virus would definitely be used by the world government, but if such a dangerous virus was used as a weapon, it would definitely cause countless deaths but he had no choice and could not stop it. First of all, because the nerve tissue has been burned to a large extent, they will not produce much pain. Likewise, the body's defense mechanisms are deactivated, allowing its strength to have no limits. In addition, through experiments, they have an extremely sensitive sense of smell for blood, their eyes have good night vision due to the light produced by thermal radiation, and their skin has some resistance to high temperatures. Finally, the most peculiar thing about this virus is that, although it warms the blood, it partially preserves the functions of blood cells, such as the coagulation of platelets. This translates into a greater ability to heal wounds. Having heard this, can you think of its use value? Ron and Eli looked at each other, seeing the perplexity in each other's eyes. Eli then hesitated before saying, create a large undead army. Hearing this, Professor Fritz shook his head in disappointment. Not everyone can have imagination. I already mentioned it before. This virus turns the host into an undead only when it invades the brain. All we have to do is find a way to stop this. Saying this, Professor Fritz paused and said with a grim look, if we can allow a soldier to retain his consciousness, he could acquire reduced pain sensitivity, superhuman strength, enhanced healing ability, and resistance to high temperatures. And the most important thing would be the ability to smell blood, spread infections through his blood, plus a lining that would protect his heart, and they only need to drink blood to function normally. The two team leaders were shocked by Professor Fritz's idea, but immediately they both looked excited. Professor, doesn't that mean that if we manage to control this virus it would mean a great advance? This would be a great achievement. Professor Fritz's face showed no sign of happiness. Instead, he said with deep concern, but the question is how to prevent the virus from invading the brain. Their carrier is blood, which circulates in blood vessels. If they are intercepted, they will only stop the blood flow, which will definitely lead to insufficient blood supply to the brain. For a while, the office was silent. That's not right. Suddenly, a three-dimensional diagram of the undead appeared in Professor Fritz's mind. He felt that he had discovered something. He quickly picked up another report and quickly turned the pages. He turned to the last page, which was the photograph of the undead. Exactly. Professor Fritz compared the three photographs of the undead, and immediately discovered something in common. Although I don't know the reason, the virus only invades the brain from the left carotid artery, and there are four blood vessels supplying blood to the brain. Although cerebral blood vessel blockage may lead to brain nerve dysfunction, it is totally worth a try. At that time, Professor Fritz no longer had any conscience or moral entanglements in his heart but was completely immersed in the research frenzy of being a scientist. Step outside for a moment. I need to write up a report to request more test subjects. The provisional code is, Undead Soldier. Imu looked at the report presented by Professor Fritz and was amazed. He really didn't expect the director of the Biochemical Research Institute, a character who didn't appear in the One Piece series, to have such abilities. Imu expressionless as he continued to turn the pages and read the report silently. The entire report is related to the virus, blood and tissues. 
he only addresses it from a biological point of view but does not mention the value of the membrane that covers the heart of the cabane. In Imo's opinion, this is no less important than the cabaneri, which they have called the undead soldier. This membrane is as thin and soft as skin, transparent as glass, as hard as steel and resistant to high temperatures. According to his memory, this can cover the blade of a katana, giving him the ability to pierce a cabane's heart easily and without damaging the weapon. Imu feels that if it were Vegapunk, the focus of this report might be different. Speaking of which, should Vegapunk be exposed to the world of cabane? It's not that Imu is afraid of Vegapunk, but what he considered was, could Vegapunk handle it all? Considering all the new scientific research projects he has in hand. In addition, Vegapunk also has to find time to think about the climate improvement plan for the Karakuri Island. It's not that the Academy of Sciences was a desert in terms of scientists, but he is in charge of important research projects, so it is easy to imagine how busy he was on a daily basis. If at this moment he had to immerse himself in the investigation of another world. Forget it, when the time comes, someone will send some of Cabane's heart membranes to Punk Hazard. It is Vegapunk's own business how to prioritize research projects. This also reminded Imu that there was still a shortage of important scientists in the Academy of Sciences. Let's see, on Karakuri Island, there is Dr. Tsukimi who is an expert in creating intelligent robots. Dr. Indigo, who investigated SIQ in One Piece film, Strong World. Dr. Wolf, an inventor from Swallow Island who was able to create a greenhouse on his farm in which he can grow crops in full conditions even in winter. He was also able to create a sea stone sword and build the polar tang. At this moment, there was a gentle knock on the door outside. Oh, is it already this time? It's time to happily torture my hawk again. Imu teasing in his heart, but maintaining his usual indifference on the outside, he stood up and walked over. Playing tennis outside during the day and teaching my hawk swordsmanship at night have become his daily entertainment. And before going to sleep, listen to some Tesoro songs. Honestly, compared to before, his life now was not so boring, and his mood was not so depressed or irritable. This allowed him to focus more on Starfish's upcoming reorganization and think more about his own power. For example, his haki. The essence of the aura is willpower or it can be said to be mental strength. The reason why his haki was so much stronger than that of the best was because over the past 800 years he had strengthened his will, naturally increasing his mental strength. Although Imu, the five elders and others are very interested in the exploration of the other world, they also know that the base of the world government is still the starfish world. Just as CP9 led by Lasky continued to penetrate deeper into the new world, the Government Affairs Council and the Navy were also in a state of extreme busyness. The approval of the Levely Agenda did not mean a resolution of the issues, but rather the beginning of them. Dragon's actions in capturing the Slaver King and clearing the Sabaody Archipelago only eliminated the two biggest cancers of the slave trade in the world. But in the Four Seas as well as the Grand Line, there are countless kingdoms and islands where the slavery industry is deeply rooted. Therefore, Navy headquarters and all of its marine branches in collaboration with the Cypher Paul and affiliated nations provided intelligence and launched the largest slave liberation campaign ever seen in the history of the world. This led many marine branches to move away from capturing pirates, its most urgent task was the complete implementation of the total prohibition of the slave trade and the total liberation of slaves in the world. Sabaody Archipelago Since the Liberation Day on September 15, the kings who attended the levely have returned home one after another, and most of the tourists have dispersed, which has brought the flow of people on the island back to normal levels. But there are changes after all. At this time, you can see strange-looking fishmen and beautiful mermaids floating with bubble rings around their waists in every area. The human residents have gotten used to it. They are no longer surprised or afraid by the appearance of fishmen, nor do they scream at the sight of fairy tale mermaids. Coupled with the complete disappearance of slave companies, auctions and slave markets, the inhabitants no longer have to look at slaves with eyes full of compassion, nor constantly worry about their safety or that of their children. 
but there is something more important. Lately, the celestial dragons, for some reason, have not been seen for a long period of time. This has prevented people from being forced to prostrate themselves and tremble in fear. People suddenly feel that their lives are more comfortable. However, among the changes, some people are happy, and others are naturally sad. Because the navy led by Dragon strictly controls the coding industry and the hotel industry, which directly caused them to lose their biggest source of income in the past. The Pirates Currently, any ship attempting to dock in the port of the Sabayati Archipelago must undergo inspection by Navy ships. If a pirate or illegal ship tries to flee, the Navy ships do not rush to pursue them, as the fishmen are responsible for piercing the hulls of the ships, turning them into floating prisons that gradually sink into the sea. Since Dragon served as the Marine Base Commander here, he has blocked 90% of the pirates from entering the Sabayati Archipelago. GR13 Area This was originally a law-free zone, but in such a dangerous area, a notorious bar appeared in recent years. It's called a Shucky's Rip-Off Bar. Look, this is the newspaper that just arrived. The owner of the bar, Shucky, with a cigarette between her fingers, placed a newspaper next to Rayleigh's glass. However, he barely glanced at it, only glancing at the headline. The nobles of the world decided to liberate the slaves in the Holy Land, and the world will broadcast live in two days. At this moment, Rayleigh frowned slightly, pushed up his round glasses, and said in a deep voice, No doubt something has happened within the world government. Everything that has happened in the last year has been unexpected and abnormal. It seems that everything comes mainly from Mary Gosa. Hmm. So what? Shucky asked blowing out a puff of white smoke. I want to know what has caused these great changes in the world government and what is erasing the era that Roger built. Rayleigh's eyes sharpened unconsciously, with the sharp aura belonging to a great swordsman. Are you thinking, of doing something crazy? Dash. Chapter 90, Chapter 90, Imminent Chaos in Mary G.O.S.A. No, absolutely not, I don't agree with you going. Shucky put out the cigarette and his angry voice suddenly solidified the atmosphere. What kind of place do you think Mary G.O.S.A. is? Or are you planning to be buried with Roger? Don't you think it's a little late for that? Rayleigh glared at the enraged Shucky. This was the first time he had seen her lose her composure. This woman was usually so free and gentle, and she looked calm even when she was beating someone up. He he he. I just want to take a look, I'm not going to wreak havoc on Mary G.O.S.A. I'll go undercover and return discreetly. He said this with great confidence. After all, as a top powerhouse in the world, self-confidence is a necessary psychological element. You're not allowed to go. Shucky looked at Rayleigh coldly and said, As long as you go, don't even think about stepping into this bar again. You should know very well that I'm not kidding now. Rayleigh remained silent, lowered his head and continued to drink the whiskey in his glass. Ding dong! At this time, a clear and melodious sound of wind chimes sounded outside the door. Immediately afterwards, the door was gently pushed open, and a tall black-haired man walking in, estimated to be two and a half meters tall, wearing a green suit and black leather boots, with a white cloak draped over his shoulders. Excuse me. Could I have a glass of juice? If you have milk cake, that would be perfect. This Navy officer sat calmly at the counter, separated from Rayleigh by two tall stools. His presence silenced the other two. Of course they can identify this person. I didn't expect the commander of the Dragon Marine base to visit this small place. But, this is a bar, juice and milk cake are not suitable. Shucky laughed naturally then took out juice and a brown black cake from the refrigerator and said with a smile, there is really no milk cake. I prefer chocolate cake. What do you think? Is it bitter? Dragon asked with a slightly troubled look. A little bit. Forget it, just juice. These simple conversations gave the feel of a normal interaction between an owner and a customer. At this time, Rayleigh asked, how did you discover me? 
it's rumored by the wind. As long as there is wind, there is no secret. Dragon replied, taking a sip of the sweet juice. Then you are here to arrest me. I'd like to do it. So? Rayleigh asked with a smile. Dragon pondered for a moment and said, I want you to leave here. Ever since he discovered Rayleigh on the night of Liberation Day, he had actually thought about capturing the former crew member of the Roger Pirates, but he gave up after thinking about it for a long time. It's not that he is afraid of the other party. Although he is not strong enough, this is the Sabayati Archipelago. The Navy headquarters is next door. He can call on the Navy Admiral and large forces for support in minutes. Dragon mainly did not want the battle to take place inside the Sabayati Archipelago. He is well aware of the terrible destruction that battles will cause between the world's major fighting forces. Even if the Navy forcibly suppresses Rayleigh and the former Rocks Pirates crew member Shucky, this place that had just begun a peaceful life will be completely destroyed. Rayleigh and Shucky looked at each other and understood Dragon's concerns. I think it will be safer if we stay here. What if we go out and are surrounded by your Navy? Then Shucky smiled and said, Vice Admiral Dragon, both he and I have withdrawn. We will not cause trouble. In the vast Sabayati archipelago, there is no place for a bar owner and a craftsman. Dragon raised his head and narrowed his eyes. A bar manager with the ability to gather intelligence from around the world and a craftsman who helps potential pirates at night. The two were silent again. Hey, it seems that you heard a lot about me from Garp. Otherwise ordinary vice-admirals wouldn't know about me Shucky teased, pretending to be relaxed. Rayleigh also smiled and said, You even know that I helped the pirates. I really can't hide anything from you. Is this your devil fruit ability? He has recently mastered the coding technique. Although he is not very proficient yet, it is still no problem to spend some time coding the pirate ship. Because the two ships that you coded before are already at the bottom of the sea. Dragon said, no expression on her face, looking at Rayleigh. You can continue coding the ships you choose, but do you plan to teach them anything else, like Hacky? The Hacky training method was an extremely scarce resource in the first half of the Grand Line, and only a few extremely talented people could master it through self-study. Seeing Rayleigh puzzled, Shucky changed the subject asking, I've heard a rumor, is it true that you tried to desert the Navy, Vice Admiral Dragon? Um. Rayleigh looked at Dragon in surprise. The son of the naval hero Garp actually wanted to betray the Navy. What kind of dramatic plot is this? Dragon responded evasively, the world government is changing. No matter how it changes, it will still be the world government of the Celestial Dragons, and the essence will not change at all. Rayleigh's tone increased and he looked at the other party seriously. But it gives me hope. Dragon said in a deep voice while looking at the newspaper on Rayleigh's desk. You don't know the history of the world government at all. What if you knew? Just as Rayleigh was about to continue speaking, Dragon interrupted him. So what if you know? Even if the past history is deplorable, if the present and the future are promising, there is no point in worrying about it. 2. In his view, the past is past, and only the future is worthy of concern. I'll give you three days. After three days, I hope you have left. After saying that, Dragon stood up and was about to walk out of the bar, only to hear Rayleigh's voice behind him. What if we don't leave? Then someone will come to talk to you, someone who only talks with his fists. 2. With the tinkling of the wind chime. Dragon's figure disappeared from the sight of the two. However, he was already considering how to isolate the area. If the Rayleigh problem could be solved by sacrificing a region, that might be acceptable. Hey, my head hurts, they have us in their sights. Rayleigh laughed. I can take you somewhere safe. Shucky looked at him and said softly, her whole ability was in gathering intelligence, so she was particularly good at escaping. Even Garp couldn't catch her back then. Well, that would be great. I'll sit tight then. Rayleigh took a long breath, looked thankful, then stood up and left the bar, 
leaving Shucky behind him frowning and staring at his back. That night, Dragon at the marine base sensed Rayleigh's aura leaving, and never returned. Pangaea Castle, Room of Authority Warkuri looked at Ju Peter and said, On your part, you should contact Da Flamingo as soon as possible. It doesn't matter if the Sea Transport King matter is delayed, but our construction department has some urgent needs. Okay. Ju Peter nodded and then handed over the four reports sent by Cipher Paul headquarters. This is the information sent back by CP9 from the other world. Take a look, there is a very shocking discovery. After receiving the reports, the four of them began to silently read the contents. The first half of the information said that Lasky and others later discovered eleven corpses infected with the undead virus. However, five of the bodies that were found had damage to the heart, and one had its head severed. They were completely dead as they didn't even react when fed with blood. At the same time, several photos were attached to the document, clearly showing the damage to the heart. This is obviously a bullet hole. Venus Juro was surprised. Yes, this shows that people in the another world can make and use firearms. This is indeed very important information. Mars has serious eyes. The question now is, how powerful are the guns of people in this world? Ju Peter shook his head and said, Unfortunately, so far, CP9 has only encountered undead, not even a single living person. They haven't even seen a ruined village. It's strange. However, what surprised me is not this. Continue reading. The other four people looked at each other and continued to turn the pages. When they reached the last two pages, the contents on the paper became strange. Because this letter is obviously written in Japanese. Although the grammar is a bit weird, the general meaning can still be understood. After all, their letters are generally written in Japanese. What does this mean? Saturn raised his head in confusion, and the other three also looked at Jew Peter with puzzled faces. This is the letter that Lasky and Marta's team found in the clothes of an undead. Everyone was stunned, their eyes widened unconsciously, and they quickly lowered their heads to check the contents of the letter again. You mean there are also Japanese characters in another world? This. How is this possible? Ju Peter sighed, at first, I was surprised too, but if you think about it, the people of this world are identical to us, dress similarly and probably have similar weapons. So it's understandable that we also share a similar language. The main writing styles in One Piece world are divided into two types. One is English, which is used in formal occasions such as official texts, professional books and reward lists. The other is Japanese, which is used in newspapers, letters and informal situations. Hearing Ju Peter's explanation, the other four could only reluctantly accept this fact. Meanwhile, he continued, based on this letter, which is supposed to be from a wife to her husband, we have found several useful pieces of information. Those undead are called Cabane by the people of another world. Furthermore, the husband who received the letter, that is, the corpse, is a samurai. At this point, he paused. In addition, the letter mentions the name of a settlement, so we can confirm that there are cities where a large number of humans gather. At this time Venus Juro said coldly, it seems that the culture of this world is very close to that of Wano country. That's true but we don't know what the fighting strength of the samurai is like in this place. Warkuri said with a slightly gloomy expression. Puru 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 puru. Suddenly, the denden mushi rang in Ju Peter's pocket. Without avoiding others, she took him out directly and replied, What's wrong? Sir, Lasky and Marta discovered railroad tracks in a plane. They are going to explore along the tracks. There is a high probability of finding a city inhabited by humans. Understood. Ju Peter hung up and put the denden mushi in his pocket. Intertwining his fingers in front of him, he asked, What do you guys think? Railways, I remember they are often used to transport minerals underground. Warkuri reflected. But I've never heard of rails used on the surface. However, 
in Water 7, they are developing sea trains that require floating tracks to connect the islands. Could it be that in this world their mode of transportation is land trains? Mars speculated. It's possible, but being able to create rails and trains, it seems that the level of civilization development in this world is not low. Saturn sighed with emotion. Warkiri said, let them continue to investigate. The current information is not enough. When we understand 70% to 80% of the situation in this world, we will consider our attitude towards it then. Okay. That was the last thing for today. We can leave. Boom. Just when he was about to announce the adjournment of the meeting, a huge roar suddenly sounded outside the window, and the strong air vibration even caused dense cracks in the glass on the window. What happened? Venus Juro stood up abruptly, with a tyrannical momentum erupting from his body. It's outside, in the socializing plaza. Jew Peter ran to the window and looked down. The next moment, his pupils suddenly constricted. Beads of cold sweat broke out on his forehead as he muttered under his breath. This is serious. At this moment, in the quiet night, the entire Mary Gosa looked completely agitated. A large number of guards rushed towards Pangaea Castle. Meanwhile, members of Cypher Paul moved quickly in the moonlight, leaving after images behind them. Pura 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 Puru. The Den Den Mushi rang again, this time it was the one on the table. Warkuri quickly grabbed the receiver and before he could speak, the voice on the other end said, Imusama ordered not to disturb his fun. 2. My Hawk. The five elders looked at each other. 1. Dash. Chapter 91, Chapter 91, Rayleigh's Last Stand. Despite being 54 years old, Rayleigh still sported her blonde hair, although if you looked closely, you might notice some scattered silver strands. At this moment, his fingers were firmly planted in the crimson rock of the cliff, his body pressed against the wall, as he looked up, where the night sky was covered in clouds and twinkling stars. The cliff to climb to the red earth continent is thousands of meters high, with cliffs so vertical that it was difficult to believe they were natural formations. Roger always loved adventure and exploration. We have been to the Fishman Island 10,000 meters under the sea, to the Sky Island 10,000 meters above the ground. We even went to the legendary Laugh Tale, but we never saw the place called the Holy Land, Mary G.O.S.A. Let me take a look this time for you. We'll talk better when we meet in the realm of the dead. For Rayleigh at this point, this action could be her own last adventure. In fact, to be honest, if Roger's carefully planned era of great pirates had not been easily ended, he would not have wanted to take such a big risk because he would rather wait and see in the Sabaody archipelago, waiting for the legendary pirate who can inherit Roger's last wish, and it's best to give him a push or something. But now, he only wants to know one thing. Why are there so many recent changes in the world government and who is behind them? His fingers curled, applying force, and with brutal force, he ascended several meters in the blink of an eye. When he felt that the momentum was close to ending, he dug his fingers into the rock wall and repeated the process, climbing at an astonishing speed towards the top of the continent. After an indeterminate amount of time, one of his hands finally touched a flat surface, he flipped hard, and, in a complete mid-air spin, landed firmly on the edge of the cliff. Finally, I arrived. Rayleigh scanned the surroundings and, using her kanbuncho kohaki, identified the presence of numerous soldiers in the distance but there were many more presences coming from a gathered crowd. Sure enough, freeing slaves or something is just a show to deceive the world. The celestial dragons are still the same celestial dragons. Under the moonlight, Rayleigh's eyes looked much gloomier, but he also knew the purpose of his trip, and he had no intention of rescuing the slaves immediately. However, when he returned, perhaps he would give these slaves a chance to regain their freedom. With that in mind, he untied the long sword strapped to his back and began to move. Nimbly, he slipped through the shadows of the trees and buildings, stealthily approaching the city, which shone with golden lights and glows. 
This place had been peaceful for too long, with almost zero levels of surveillance, which is why in the One Piece series Fisher Tiger was successful in his attack. Even if the alert level was later raised because of this, the Revolutionary Army could still sneak in easily. Rayleigh's target was Pangaea Castle. Because he had heard that the Five Elders, the highest in the hierarchy of the Celestial Dragons, were there. Besides, his sixth sense told him that he would find the answers there. Imma was holding an ordinary sword, while teaching swordsmanship to My Hawk. While they were sparring, Imu easily overpowered My Hawk, who was constantly backing away. My Hawk's chest rose and fell, taking heavy, rapid breaths. Hmm. At that moment, Imu raised an eyebrow and suddenly stopped his movement, allowing My Hawk to catch his breath. He took advantage of this brief respite to adjust and catch his breath. With approximately 30 minutes left in training, My Hawk thought Imu was giving him a break. However, he was surprised to see Imu putting away the sword. Imu-sama. An interesting mouse has snuck in. Meanwhile, Rayleigh had managed to infiltrate safely inside Pangaea Castle, reaching the socializing plaza. Then he turned into a shadow and headed towards the inner doors of the castle. He had noticed lights on a specific level, where clearly five presences were gathered. It was very likely that it was the five elders. Boom. However, just at the moment when Rayleigh's right foot was about to step onto the staircase, an extremely domineering energy wave exploded from the hallway behind the door. Have I been discovered? But this force? Rayleigh turned around without hesitation. Her goal was to gather information, not create a ruckus in Mary G.O.S.A., she had no need to fight. His speed is very fast, but his figure disappeared from the scene for less than a second when he was stopped by a flash of light that descended from the sky, blocking his path. Clang! With a clear sound of metal colliding, Rayleigh felt an extremely domineering force spreading through the blade towards his hand. His body was thrown backwards. After managing to stop his advance, when he looked up, he saw a white figure with his back to the bright moon, floating in the air as if he were suspended in nothingness. The moment their eyes met, Rayleigh felt a shiver run down his spine. An emotion he hadn't felt in a long time filled his heart. Fear. What happened? What's the situation? Jun and Stussy hurried from the castle. At the same time, figures dressed in black, exuding a ferocious aura, appeared in every corner with the whistling of air, completely surrounding the socializing plaza in an instant. Stop. At this time, my hawk who was already standing outside the venue, raised his arm to stop the two women and said in a deep voice, Tonosama has ordered that no one interrupt him. That man is. The moment Jun saw Rayleigh's face on the field, her pupils suddenly constricted, and a name emerged in her mind. My hawk's sharp gaze locked onto Rayleigh as he said in a low voice. Silver's Rayleigh, former first mate of the Roger Pirates, known as the right hand of the Pirate King, nicknamed the Dark King, and probably the strongest swordsman out of prison since Gold Lion Shiki was captured. My Hawk originally planned to find Rayleigh to challenge him after he fought his way towards the Great Swordsman. Now it seems that he will no longer have a chance. This time the other party must die here. Are you part of the rumored God's Knights? Rayleigh felt the oppressive aura emanating from that person and could barely maintain his casual smile. This aura is stronger than Roger, he is definitely an extremely powerful person. As Rayleigh pondered, he felt the sword in his hand tremble slightly. Seeing that the other party just looked at him condescendingly, Rayleigh said with a smile, I didn't expect that there would be a strong person like you among the celestial dragons. It's really unexpected. As soon as he finished speaking, a strong killing intent suddenly erupted from him, and the nameless long sword in his hand trembled and a bright silver sword light suddenly appeared. The dazzling light made Jun and Stussy instinctively close their eyes, but my hawk squinted to continue seeing. Suddenly, with a clear metallic sound, the silver glow disappeared inexplicably, and throughout the entire process, my hawk couldn't see what had happened. Again, Imu said. Rayleigh's expression turned grim. 
but he knew that the most important thing now was not to fight the powerful celestial dragon in front of him, but to find a way to escape as soon as possible. It was a shame that the purpose of this trip was not fulfilled. Do you want to run away? You do not have an escape. At that moment, Imu as if knowing what was going on in Rayleigh's mind, said in a cold voice. No, you, the fool who has been seduced by the will of the D, never had a future. When a creature like you enters a domain that does not belong to you, you are destined to be crushed. However, your courage to see the glory of the Holy Land even if you commit an unforgivable crime is worthy of my praise. I have decided to give you the opportunity to burn your last light under my gaze, and then extinguish you in the long river of history, small and weak light. He 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 he. What an amazing speech, hey. Just as Rayleigh was going to say something else, a flash of red light came towards him. With her sword guided solely by instinct, she blocked in front of him immediately. There was a thunderous metallic sound, followed by an explosion of power. And that wasn't all, his ears picked up the sound of several rips of air coming from all directions. Rayleigh quickly made his sword dance around his until it formed a whirlpool, constantly adjusting his movements with the help of his Kanbuncho Kuhaki, fighting against the invisible force that surrounded him. The metallic sound constantly echoed in the air. In my hawk's eyes from outside the battlefield, Rayleigh's sword lights were like spinning silver blades and were extremely sharp. The sword light that constantly surrounded him was the best teaching for him. Although it was unclear what ability Imu was using, he could see the dense amount of attacks surrounding Rayleigh, and the speed and strength of these attacks forced him to take defense seriously. What, what impressive sword skills! Jun murmured with his hand over his mouth. Although he couldn't follow Rayleigh's movements well, the subtle sword lights left in the air also provided him with a lot of inspiration. Stussy next to her was silent with a solemn expression. Humph! At that moment, a snort of fury evident on the battlefield sounded. The always kind Rayleigh was being provoked by the continuous attack coming from all directions. Rumble! Suddenly, a dark red aura that glowed with silver lightning erupted from his body and swept across the entire place. So, is this an invisible edge? Or is it a devil fruit ability? Rayleigh asked in a deep voice. But there was no response from Imu. He just looked down at him, as if he had no interest in saying anything else. In that case, I'll have to finish you off before I leave. It's been a long time since I've tried my best. Hearing Rayleigh's threatening statement, Imu was not surprised but rather overjoyed. He had been waiting for a long time to find someone with whom he could test his abilities. Suddenly, the sharp sounds of air being torn could be heard again. Although they were not very loud, since there were no other noises and it was night, they were quite clear. Rayleigh roared when he saw this. He completely released his house Hoku Haki. Then with his sword, flickering with dense silver-colored rays, he slashed forward, a dazzling glow erupted, forming a gigantic crescent-shaped slash. The air that was affected along the way turned into billowing energy under the extreme pressure, forcing all the invisible swords around him away. The ground where the cut passed split deeply. Um. However, the flying slash, which were so majestic and ferocious, its speed was, it was slowing down. Which caused everyone's looks to become strange. It was unknown how much time passed, but when it finally reached three meters away from Imu, the slash exploded, crumbling into silver flashes that scattered all over the place like stars falling from the sky. This is impossible. Dash. Chapter 92, Chapter 92, Fall of the Dark King. But Rayleigh was Rayleigh after all. As vice-captain of the Roger Pirates, he possessed the ability to remain calm and reason at all times, frantically analyzing the situation. In an instant he thought of many explanations for what just happened. Rayleigh then looked at Imu and realized that the latter was not actually floating in the air with some devil fruit ability, but rather he was using an invisible hacky to stay in the air. However, that very thing left Rayleigh surprised, as it surpassed his understanding of hacky. Hacky could certainly manifest externally to affect material reality, 
but that manifestation was usually explosive and could not be sustained for long. To maintain it for a long time, it had to be attached to the surface of an object or covering a part of the body. Imu, in his more than 800 years, had refined, purified and pushed the three types of haki to the limit, before fusing them. From that moment on, for him, haki no longer had categories. And not only that. During these long years, Imu's sword mastery had surpassed that of even the greatest swordsman. He called this kingdom Sword Saint. Over hundreds of years, he had seen numerous exceptional swordsmen, but only Shimatsuki Ryama of Wano country came close to this level. Imu then advanced further, combining his swordsmanship and haki, forming these invisible streams of sword energy that could manifest anywhere within the domain of his haki. Imu called it divine territory. Imu's abilities were not complicated, and they were not extravagant. He had already experienced enough with his abilities, so his interest in Rayleigh was beginning to wane. He wanted to put on an impressive show to send this dark king to his death. The next instant, Rayleigh saw sword lights condensing behind Imu one after another, flashing with golden lightning. Their numbers were increasing at a speed visible to the naked eye, and soon the night sky in all directions was completely covered by a multitude of golden flashes. These sword lights are wrapped with haki. And that color, a gold never seen before. This has really become a big problem. At that moment, Shucky's face appeared in his mind. If I had known. Swoosh, 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 swoosh. All the sword lights transformed into rapid golden flashes, completely covering Rayleigh. The flashes of silver lights were savagely bombarded by the golden flashes. Streams of sword lights clashed and defended against each other, an intense battle of attack and defense, lightning colliding and fading. It is unknown how much time passed, but the flashes began to flash incessantly. Drops of red blood splashed in the moonlight, evaporating into red mist as they were hit by fleeting electrical flashes. Suddenly, my hawk and the others noticed that the lightning bolts and streams of sword lights in the air began to decrease. When the last light fell, they saw Rayleigh lying on the ground. His back, arms, legs, everything was filled with sword lights that were shining gold, he was clearly on the verge of death. Roger, my journey seems to have come to an end here. It's been a life of adventure, a truly great one. Silver's Rayleigh was shot down in his nighttime attempt to climb to the Red Earth continent and raid the holy land of Mary Geoase. With the intentional propaganda of the world government, the attention of the people of the world was suddenly diverted from the impending slave liberation event in Mary Geoase, which will soon be broadcast to the world, to focus on another matter. However, for ordinary people, all of that was simply passing entertainment. After all, even the Pirate King had been executed by the Navy, the fact that the right hand of the Pirate King was cut off didn't seem like such a shocking thing. The news of Rayleigh's death had a more shocking effect on circles of power around the world, especially among those who once stood against him. The moment Shanks saw the newspaper title, he was completely stunned. Of course he was aware of the movement that night. At that moment, he was wondering who would have the audacity to cause such chaos in this place, but he never expected that it would be the Rayleigh San. On the other hand, for Dragon, who protects the Sabayati archipelago, the biggest concern caused by this incident is the sudden disappearance of the owner of Shucky's rip-off bar. Afterwards, everything gradually returned to normal, with the majority more concerned about the global transmission that would take place in a few days. After all, it would be a huge rare thing for the celestial dragons to decide to liberate all slaves. Thus, for a world in the midst of drastic change, Rayleigh's death only caused a brief one day to stir. On the Red Earth continent, in Area RL1556, on the other side of the dimensional gate in the world of Cabane, everything was continuing as usual. Even though large construction teams could not enter, thanks to the efforts of many skilled craftsmen, the base camp built around the dimensional gate was becoming increasingly sophisticated. At night, Lasky and Marta, who were walking west along the newly discovered railway track, encountered many cabane. 
These undead beings looked at them with pitch black eyes and bright red pupils, emitting guttural roars filled with hunger, advancing towards the fresh meat that had just appeared. But Lasky and Marta have long been accustomed to their presence. Lasky could easily fire jets of air from a distance with a simple movement of his fingers, instantly piercing the luminous hearts of the cabane. While Marta, she was more accustomed to using her legs to cut off the cabane's heads with her high and sharp heels. They had already discovered the weakness of these undead, in addition to their luminous hearts, it was also the head. Cutting off their heads didn't make them die quickly, but it left them dormant, turned into pieces of purple and black flesh that still glistened on the ground. These things are really endless, don't people in this world clean them up? Marta adjusted her golden locks messy from the night wind and smiled charmingly. Meanwhile, Lasky, evidently a tough guy with no romantic interest, continued his path along the iron rails. She didn't care, she was already used to his personality. In normal times, he would treat her to red wine or buy her jewelry, but during missions, he became extremely ruthless, cold, without jokes or kindness. Lasky had once told him that he didn't want to make any mistakes that would prevent them from going to Guanhao Island to see their daughter. Um. Suddenly, Lasky, who was walking in front, raised his hand to signal to stop, listened to the sound brought by the night wind, and said, There are gunshots ahead, but this gunshot is very strange and sounds a bit muffled. We finally found living people. Marta exclaimed excitedly. Yes. Let's take a look, but stay hidden. Understood. As soon as she finished speaking, both of them quickly disappeared in a couple of flashes, turning into dark shadows that entered the nearby forest and quickly headed towards the train tracks. Sure enough, as the distance continued to get closer, even Marta heard distinct bursts of gunfire, as well as explosions and the whine of the engine. This made the two people's eyes show undisguised expectation. Finally, they were about to contact the human civilization of this world. Emerging from the forest, they found themselves on a high hill, and they quickly lay down to hide, squinting to take a detailed look at the battle on the plain below them. Although it was the middle of the night, the flames and flashes from the explosions provided enough light from their perspective. They could see a large blurry black shadow in the distance, which looked like a huge city wall and various buildings inside. It was obvious that they had found a human city. The battle in front of them was taking place in a wide space outside the city, a black train lay like a giant beast on the ground, with its armor open towards them, revealing the interior. A soldier in black, with a night vision half-mask on his face, crouched next to what was clearly a mortar, firing projectiles that generated most of the light and noise on the battlefield. At the same time, some people riding motorcycles, holding long guns with tubes attached, jumped off the train and moved quickly across the battlefield, accurately shooting at the undead, in coordination with the ground soldiers fighting on foot. Although each of their bullets cannot be said to have hit the vital point, most of them did hit the head and heart of the undead. Moreover, the distance between the two parties was kept very close when shooting. It was not like fighting with firearms at all. Is this the armed army of this world? At this time, Marta suddenly raised her finger and pointed to a place and said, Look what he is doing. Lasky looked in the direction where his companion was pointing. Sure enough, he saw a soldier, after shooting at close range at the heart of an undead, kneel and place something on his chest. The next instant, a bang was heard, the soldier had burst his own heart without hesitation. What is he doing? Marta said in surprise. Why the hell would he want to kill himself? He doesn't seem to be seriously injured. Lasky pushed up the dark red glasses on his face, and after careful observation, he speculated, he seemed to have been bitten on the calf by Cabane, so he chose to commit suicide in order not to threaten his companions. If that is the case, then the consciousness of the soldiers in this world is quite high. CP members can't blow their hearts out without hesitation let alone the army and navy, right? Hearing Marta's words, Lasky nodded and said, this also shows how heavy the pressure these undead people called Cabane have brought to them. But now I'm more curious. 
Judging from their current strength and efficiency in eliminating the cabane, it's obvious that they can't solve all the cabane here, and I'm sure there are many more cabane in that city. Marta looked at the open city gate and agreed, indeed, it must have been captured. From here, you can see the fire everywhere. Then what do we do now? Lasky thought for a moment and said, inform the rear base and ask them to send troops over. Although the city has fallen, there must be a lot of information in it. Marta next to him looked at him doubtfully and asked, What about us, why don't we go in and take a look? We will follow these armed forces. A fallen city is dead and cannot escape, but these people are alive, and the value of keeping an eye on them is even greater. Contact the base immediately. Marta saw that he had made a decision and said no more. Cautiously, she backed away until she was a safe distance from the top of the hill. Once she was sure that no one below would notice her, she pulled out a communication device and quietly explained the situation to her base. Five minutes later, the call ended. Ready. Marta crouched down and crawled back to Lasky's side. He raised his chin slightly and reminded her, what are they doing? She looked down from above with narrowed eyes. She discovered that those soldiers in black, after eliminating most of the cabane on the plane with minimal losses, began to capture some cabane alive, with broken limbs, using some kind of giant pincers. They were then dragged into a jet black armored train car. They're catching them alive too. Lasky nodded and said, yes, they probably have the same goal as us, to investigate these cabane. But this also means that they are leaving soon. Let's follow them quickly and find a way to board the train. Be careful not to be exposed yet. After saying that, Lasky and Marta turned into afterimages again and quickly approached downwards. Indeed. As Lasky had predicted, after that group of soldiers in black packed 30 or 40 cabane onto the train, they began to retreat in order. They took the firearms of their fallen comrades and some yellow cylindrical devices that they carried on their backs. When the last group of motorcyclists returned to the train, the armor doors closed automatically, and the train beeped from the front. Soon, that black beast under the starry sky roared forward, gradually accelerating. But no one noticed two shadows approaching from behind at a speed faster than that of the train. Just before the train reached its maximum speed, they effortlessly jumped to the end of the train. Dash. Chapter 93 Chapter 93, Encounter at Yashiro Station, Crocodile's Arrival When Lasky and Marta landed on the train, there was no obvious noise. The whole process seemed so silent amidst the noise. Marta clung to the iron sheet of the outer carriage, alert to the movement inside that was glowing with orange light, and asked in a low voice, what should we do next? Lasky deadpanned, let's try to capture one of them, put on their clothes, and blend in. If they speak the same language, I'll probably understand what they're saying. Let's first find out who these soldiers are. As he spoke, he took off the glasses from the bridge of his nose, folded them and put them in his coat pocket, revealing his sharp and indifferent eyes. From their performance in the previous battle, although they are soldiers, they are weak. They don't even compare to the marines of the branches of the four seas, they are ordinary people who have received some military training and there are only a few who are agile. Marta nodded and suddenly asked a strange question, yes, but there is a problem. How are you going to solve it? What a problem. I noticed that the height of this group of people is generally less than 1.8 meters, with an average height of 1.7 meters, and I am 1.85 meters, and you. This sensual and attractive blonde woman dressed in black examined Lasky up and down with her beautiful eyes. I remember you are two meters tall, right? Lasky's cold expression froze instantly. One. He didn't expect that one day he would be in trouble because he was too tall, but the problem was that he was not considered tall in his native world. The dimensional gate base that received Marta's report became even more lively at this time. The officials in charge of administration quickly passed the news of the discovery of large cities and armed forces. 
After receiving this information Imo's response was to completely delegate the exploration and development of the new world to the five elders. After receiving this order, they decided to send a large army force. Room of Authority Should we take bullet too? Warkuri looked at Venus Juro and asked him and the latter, with half-closed eyes, observed the sword in his embrace and replied, he will know sooner or later. Let him go. Yes, Crocodile has already gone. Barrett has no reason not to go. Maybe, once he finds out about this, he will behave more obediently. Mars said with a smile. But if you want to use Bullet, you have to ask Imusama for an order. That bastard won't listen to our words. Jew Peter said dissatisfiedly, this is the same for Crocodile. He has been gone for so long and hasn't sent back any news. I don't believe that he didn't find anything. Let him go, this is what Imusama wants. Venus Juro said calmly. As long as I return at the end, the army will have additional reinforcement. Then, we will have to train Crocodile, he is still quite weak. At least we have to make up for his deficiencies in physical and hacky skills. When the time comes, let him go to your Cypher Paul headquarters for training. You are experts in that area. Actually, the best option would be to send Crocodile to Zephyr for a year of training, but that would make him a member of the Navy, and Zephyr may not be willing to accept him. Okay. The five elders made a decision and orders began to be rapidly transmitted from top to bottom, and soon the army headquarters was notified. Upon receiving the order, 2,000 fully armed army soldiers quickly assembled, forming a complete regiment. There weren't many. But who made the dimensional gate that size? If there are too many people, it would take too long to queue to get through. Ten minutes later, everyone was wearing hard leather gloves, metal arm and leg armor, black military uniforms, automatic rifles on their backs, and a string of grenades and long knives hanging on their waists. Then they rode on military motorcycles and were led by bullet. With a deafening roar, they emerged through the imposing steel doors of the army headquarters. At this time, Bullet had put on a full dark blue suit, black leather boots, and the cloak of justice with white letters on a black background on his shoulders. Lieutenant General Douglas Bullet Dimensional Base No. 001 in Zone RL1556 After entering the base in the New World Bullet began to understand the basic information about the world. He then approached the cell where an active cabane was being held captive. You say this thing can easily break an iron plate? Yes. The government official who had previously led the way and explained the tasks to Lasky and other CP9 members nodded. His name was Addison, and he was a senior director of the administration department, who was Carlson's colleague. Bullet greatly enjoyed his role as a military leader. Born in war, raised in war, even betrayed by war, he remained passionate about it, considering betrayals to be just a part of war. And now, he was fighting otherworldly adversaries. That turned her blood on even more. For Bullet, this mission was not so much a war as it was extensive combat training for his soldiers. He was sure that these 2,000 soldiers, after facing these terrifying undead, would quickly become resolute veterans. And then, it would be time to bring in a new group. By the way, I heard that Crocodile Guy is here too. Bullet was obviously unhappy about this. He obviously joined the army first and was still a high-ranking lieutenant general, but he entered here behind a bastard who was still a criminal. What are the five elders thinking? If they want to recruit Crocodile, they could have brought him directly to me. I have ways to make him behave and join me like a good subordinate. Addison on the side suddenly twitched his mouth when he heard Bullet being so disrespectful to the five elders. He looked around with an awkward expression, pretending that he didn't hear anything. Reporting to the lieutenant general. The troops have finished assembling. Please give us your instructions. An army colonel shouted, approaching quickly. Actually, the army did not have cloaks of justice in the past, but since Bullet joined, all the benefits are the same as those in the Navy. Let them heat up their motorcycles and set off soon. Yes. 
After the army colonel left, Addison raised his head in confusion and asked, Lieutenant General Bullitt, are you going to the fallen city immediately? But it's night now, and your order is to leave tomorrow morning. Humph, everyone is here, why are you waiting for tomorrow? If my soldiers can't even march at night, they might as well be trampled to death by me, so as not to embarrass me. Bullet snorted heavily, turned and left the cell area, while leaving the last words behind. I am the lieutenant general of the army. Now that I am here, all military operations here must be under my control. Addison watched helplessly as Bullet disappeared from her field of vision, feeling like he was a little too domineering and overbearing. Couldn't they discuss things? Army officers used to be much more respectful and restrained in front of senior officials. But now, Addison didn't dare say much. Ah, it seems that the army is really taking off. But even though they are riding a motorcycle, they won't arrive when it's dawn? Why the rush? Twenty minutes later. Open the door. With a loud shout, the towering steel door was quickly opened afraid of being smashed by a man riding a special motorcycle. In an instant, the vast center of the peninsula, where the base was located, was completely awakened by the hustle and bustle of motorcycles. Many who were resting in the dormitories and barracks looked in the direction of the door, cursing furiously. But Barrett didn't care about this. At full speed, he launched himself into the darkness. Behind him, Large groups of heavily armored soldiers on motorcycles stood at a distance from each other, and long lines continued to leave the base. At the moment, the World Government Army took the first step to conquer this world. Hey, look, what is that? High on the walls, next to one of the cannons, a soldier on guard heard the loud alert from his nearby companions and quickly turned to take a look. Sure enough, he saw a figure walking slowly along the tracks. This thing is so strange. How could someone come from the wild on foot? There are so many cabane outside. What do we do, open the door? Another soldier asked hesitantly. This city gate is both a city gate and a suspension bridge. Perhaps we should ask Nishishi-sama. My words have no weight here. All right. Soon, the samurai Nishishitaku, in charge of the defense that night, received the news. After hearing it, he looked skeptically at the soldier who gave it to him. Are you sure it's not some cabane that strayed here? Uh, Nishishisama, he didn't emit red light and his walk seemed stable. This. Nishishitaku also hesitated. Finally, he decided to go up to take a look, but just then, there was a commotion outside. He frowned his right hand resting cautiously on the hilt of his sword as he quickly approached and shouted, What's going on? Nishishisama. That, that person, the man who was walking from the field, he, he has arrived. Said the soldier who ran there trembling. Um. Nishishitaku was also stunned for a moment, and then said angrily, How dare they open the door to him without permission? W. We didn't. Meanwhile, on top of the wall, about twenty armed soldiers looked at this giant man in horror. They even forgot that they were holding weapons. They called him a giant because he was easily over seven feet tall, maybe eight feet tall. For those who had an average height of just five feet seven or even less, it was disconcerting. They had never seen someone so tall in their lives. But what shocked them the most, even a little horrified, was that this man had just jumped up from outside the protective pit under the city. Hey, what is this place? Suddenly, the giant spoke first, and the soldiers surrounding him looked at each other. Although the accent and grammar sounded strange, they did understand. Uh, sir, this is Yashiro Station. A bolder soldier answered with courage. Oh Crocodile looked over in surprise. He really didn't expect these people to understand what he said. He just tried to ask a question. Okay, where's the place where they sell food around here? Well, it should be the shopping street in the north. It is now a night market, and there are many vendors selling food there. After getting the answer he wanted, 
Crocodile threw down a small gold coin, which he collected from the undead on the way here. As a pirate, he was especially sensitive to world currencies. On the contrary, people in CP9 will not go out of their way to search the body of every undead. Oh, thank you, thank you, sir. The soldier who answered the question looked surprised when he saw that there was still a bounty, which made the other soldiers feel envious and regretful. At the same time, Crocodile looked to the north of the city and saw a brightly lit area. Then he casually walked down the stairs and down the city wall under the astonished eyes of a soldier along the way. Who are you? However, when Crocodile was about to go to the supposed night market, a samurai with his sword and a dozen armed soldiers stopped him. Th this this. When Nishishi Taku noticed Crocodile's height and build, he instinctively stopped but he had already caught the giant's attention. Crocodile glanced at him condescendingly, but this glance instantly made the latter retreat in horror, as if he had seen some terrible scene, and even staggered and knocked down several soldiers behind him. 1. Dash. Chapter 94, Chapter 94, Crocodile's Unexpected Showdown. A Samurai. Although Crocodile does not have House Hoku Haki, the power of Haki itself is also related to a person's courage, killing intent, and other mental forces. This allowed the imposing presence to manifest almost in a real way in the powerful people of the starfish world. So weak. Seeing the man dressed as a samurai in such a state, Crocodile shook his head in disdain and walked away. He is hungry. Who is he? Didn't he get an inspection? Nishishitaku exclaimed, embarrassed and furious as he saw Crocodile walk away from the door. At the same time, he furiously questioned himself. He was just a big man, could he take on so many weapons? Why the hell was I scared? What a shame! Inspection was the procedure when outsiders entered the city. They had to line up, strip naked, and be thoroughly examined by several people to see if they had injuries. Well, no, but... At this moment, an armed soldier approached Nishishitaku and whispered, Sir, but he jumped from below to here. Nishishitaku looked at the soldier in disbelief, as if he thought he was stupid. But the soldier pointed to several other soldiers and said in a low voice, If you don't believe me, ask them. Many saw it. This man ran from outside and jumped over the moat to get here. Yet. Yes, 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 we all saw it. You must not provoke him. We just used a searchlight to illuminate the direction in which the man came. The road was densely packed with Cabane's corpses. Nishishitaku also fell silent immediately, because his three views were being seriously challenged. He was even a little dizzy and out of breath. It took him a long time to calm down. Go and keep an eye on him but just keep an eye on him from a distance. Don't act rashly. I'll go see the steward right away. Yes. The night market should be the brightest and liveliest place in a city after it turns to night. It is filled with the faint smoke of fireworks, the aroma of tempting food and the lively and melodious laughter of girls. Crocodile could hear the constant noise of the vendors here. Men, women, and children wearing various bathrobes or coarse cloths were coming and going with temporary joy on their faces. But the sudden presence of a tall, striking figure generated shouts along his path, automatically dispersing the crowd in his path. Crocodile didn't care about this and followed the smell of food to a stall selling grilled chicken skewers. He first observed the quality of the chicken, and then placed an order to the confused boss. Ten skewers of chicken a glass of wine, any wine will do, and a plate of ketchup. Do you know what ketchup is? If not, bring me a tomato and a bowl, and I'll make it myself. In the early morning, when the morning sun just emerged, Crocodile opened his eyes, got out of bed and opened the attic window. Suddenly, a breath of fresh air hit his face, and he began to quietly gaze at this city called Yashiro Station. Yesterday, while he was eating, someone named Tanaka Akira visited him, apparently the ruler of this city, a role similar to that of a mayor. In fact, 
he wanted to invite him to be his samurai chief, which made him laugh so much that he burst into laughter on the spot. This naturally aroused dissatisfaction with the other party and other samurai, but after he threw the wooden skewer after eating the meat on it and breaking the sword that a samurai had just drawn, these people calmed down again. This established a solid foundation for more friendly communication between both parties. Now, they even allowed him to stay freely in this comfortable attic. Crocodile thought that the people here were not bad at all. They are so welcoming. From there, he could clearly see the tall platforms and huge cranes in the distance. This Yashiro station seems to be a city built around the mining industry. The center is a large-scale ore layer dug by hand. The crane should be used to transport minerals. At the same time, there are two train tracks running from the north and south of the city, running through the east and west gates. After having a basic understanding of this place, the first thing Crocodile thought of was the base of the world government that had invaded this world. In Crocodile's opinion, given the typical behavior of the world government, they could not be interested in friendly cooperation. Surely, once they assessed the strength of this world, they would seek to conquer it on a large scale. This Yashiro station, with its vast veins of metal, would undoubtedly be one of the world government's main objectives. But, what does this have to do with him? At that moment, what Crocodile was worried about was his own destiny. After observing for these days, he had confirmed that this was truly a new world. To his surprise, the world government was not deceiving him. Join the army. It's really a multiple choice question with no room for choice at all. They are still as dominant as ever, quahahahaha. He didn't know what to think. Looking at the rising sun outside the window, he started to laugh like a classic big breath, but he was actually laughing at himself. I was really moved, so moved that I wanted to agree to them. But what if I don't agree? Do I really want to die in this boring world full of undead? Crocodile murmured to himself. Then how will I be able to challenge the monster Whitebeard in the future? And that bastard Douglas Bullet, if I am imprisoned in this broken world, he will definitely find an opportunity to show off his power in front of me in the future. Images of Bullet becoming a great army general automatically appeared in his mind, with a disdainful and superior expression. Just thinking about it, Crocodile gritted his teeth. Humph! Isn't it just the army? I remember that there are three admirals in the navy, and most likely the army has something similar. If so, I should become an army general first and then promote to marshal, and then I will make that idiot my subordinate. Boom, 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 boom. Just when Crocodile was looking at the crane that was several times larger and taller than an ordinary crane, a burst of intensive shelling woke him up and also woke up the entire Yashiro station. All the residents hurriedly walked out of their homes or opened their windows and looked in the direction of the East Gate. At this moment, the East City Gate has completely fallen into chaos and panic. Although the impressive artillery fire attempted to encourage the soldiers, the imposing figure approaching from outside the city, enduring gunshots and explosions, was discouraging. A soldier collapsed slumped beside the city wall, his face was pale, and he smiled miserably. He had completely lost his courage and even had no courage to look back. We are lost, completely lost. It's the fused colony. We won't be able to stop it, Yashiro Station will fall soon. No one stood up to criticize him for his performance and remarks that disturbed the morale of the army, because except for the soldiers who fired wildly, everyone on the city wall was in a similar mood to him. Even the normally aloof samurai had abandoned their responsibilities and their spirit and fled desperately to the city. It's chaos, it's all chaos. At this moment, the young soldier, who was lying on the ground and trembling all over, suddenly felt a gust of wind and sand blowing around him, and then a somewhat familiar voice sounded in his ears. Boy, I remember you, tell me, what is that? The young soldier slowly raised his stiff neck and was finally able to see the newcomer's face. Sir, sir, it's you. Of course, he still remembered Crocodile, 
who yesterday gave him a small gold coin and he used it to buy two portions of meat last night to take home for his parents and little sister to try. In this city that lost its outside land because of cabane, there is not much room to grow rice. Food itself is very scarce, let alone meat. Enough of nonsense. Crocodile looked into the distance, where a large mass of smoke was forming with flashes of fire and felt great interest. This different world finally brought him a surprise. At first, the undead were a novelty, but then they became boring, as annoying as flies. After collecting enough money, he simply ignored them and continued forward at full speed. Ah, yes, yes. The young soldier stood up in a hurry, holding his steam gun in his arms. Being next to this man gave him a strange feeling of security and gave him back a little strength. We call it Fused Colony. It is said that when enough cabane are gathered in a small area, one cabane will become the core, which will absorb other cabane and turn them into a larger body. Although they appear to be scattered, they are actually a single being with great strength and speed. And because of their size, they almost reach the height of the walls, and some even surpass them, allowing them to easily pass over moats and walls. When that happens, at this point, the young man's face was once again full of despair and panic. It was a real hell on earth. At this time, the fused colony that was 30 or 40 meters high had already approached the open space about 300 meters away from the city wall, and on both sides were rolling grey hills without any vegetation. Oh! It's interesting, a combined monster that's taller than the giants. Crocodile's face showed a playful smile eager to try. I also know a damn fused bastard. The next moment, Crocodile under the stunned gazes of countless soldiers and samurai around him, turned into a whirlwind of earth yellow sand and flew out of the city wall, seemingly facing the terrifying fused colony. Desert Spada Crocodile quickly flew into the sky without hesitation. The moment his upper body returned to his human form, he formed a loose sheet of rapidly moving sand with his right hand. He then threw the sand blade towards the fused colony below that had not yet noticed it. Swoosh! The sand blade, lengthening with the wind, expanded in an instant before everyone's astonished gaze, quickly passing behind the fused colony. Then his massive body made of cabane split in two, also splitting the bare grey mounds on both sides. Boom! Only after all this occurred, a deafening explosion resounded through the air followed by a surge of violent air, a side effect of the air being quickly split by the sand blade. The soldiers on the wall, hundreds of them holding steam rifles and swords, were completely stunned by the scene, as if someone had pressed the pause button for all of them. No screaming, no trembling, no running away, even the cannons stopped, passively watching as the terrifying fused colony fell in two, with an opening so large that it allowed a glimpse of what lay on the other side. God! Have the gods finally come to save us? A soldier didn't even notice that the steam gun in his hand fell to the ground. He looked up at the tall figure surrounded by wind and sand under the blue sky, slowly knelt on the ground, raised his hands with tears in his eyes and shouted. Lord God! Lord God! The soldiers who had been subjected to high pressure due to threats to their lives from the cabane for many years seemed to have found an outlet for their long repressed negative emotions. They all followed the example of the first and knelt down and shouted continuously, their tear-filled faces showing fanaticism. Ah, what are those guys shouting? Crocodile frowned at the commotion that had arisen behind him, but didn't pay much attention to it, then muttered, I should have brought some cigars. Hum. It was then that he realized that the fused colony, which had been cut off, was quickly regrouping. Even the torn remains at the edge of the wound, under the influence of the cabane, were coming together to form a new body. Dash. Chapter 95, Chapter 95, Unexpected Returns Roar After the fused colony regained its shape, it roared angrily towards crocodile in the air. After being hit hard and feeling severe pain, it finally noticed the small ball of yellow sand. What an interesting thing. It's obviously just a pile of meat pieces gathered together, 
but its surface strength is comparable to that of a rock mass, and it even has obvious eyes and mouths. But it's still too weak. The giant's bodies are not that fragile. Crocodile's fur coat fluttered in the strong wind, but his eyes were full of curiosity. Looking at its reaction, it even feels pain and emotions, and 80% of it has something to do with that thing called the core. At the same time, the emerged colony stood up, then waved its huge arm covered in corpses and cabane and slammed hard towards Crocodile's location. Boom! His strength was undoubted, just a simple blow caused an explosion of air, explaining how he could easily tear down the thick walls. But although his power was great, he lacked hacky or any other supernatural energy. For someone with elemental abilities like Crocodile's, his attacks were meaningless. Crocodile was too lazy to dodge its attack, and allowed it to blow up his body, and then reassembled the wind and sand in another place in the air to reveal his human form. Seeing this scene, the people on the city wall became even more convinced that he was a real god. The god of sand. It seems that the way to deal with this thing is either to polish off all the undead on it, or to target its core. Thinking of this, he directly used his Kanbuncho Kohaki, and gave the fused colony a thorough check, feeling it from top to bottom. As expected, deep within the latter's head, he sensed the source of the strongest aura. However, this also made Crocodile discover something interesting. Strong mental fluctuations, full of negative emotions of fear, rage, and greed. At the moment when Crocodile's mental fluctuations came into contact with the mental fluctuations in the core of the fused colony, an image of an unknown man even appeared in his mind, who seemed to be some kind of memory of his family. It seems that this is his essence, does it originate from the special power of the heart like Haki? In the next moment, just as the fused colony struck him tirelessly, Crocodile opened the palm of his right hand, from where a whirlwind of sand emerged that rotated at high speed. Then let me see what your core is like. Sables when this whirlwind was released, it instantly expanded into a veritable massive whirlwind of sand. He first shattered the huge black palm that was charging towards Crocodile into fragments, and then slammed into his body. Fused Colony and Sables collide head-on. But the winner was decided in a second. The former's body was brutally torn apart by the raging wind and the blade-like gravel. It is difficult to describe the tragic situation of the fused colony with such terrible words as fragmented. Cruelly stripped, its surface was torn, revealing a heart and eyes of cabane that glowed with a subtle blue glow. When the sand figure embodied by Crocodile appeared in front of her, the fused colony showed an expression of terror and fury. Typical death struggle, a trapped beast still fighting. Quahahahaha. Blue light. You really do everything to show your specialness, but your unique heart should be of great value, right? Since he had decided to join the world government's army, Crocodile thought it would be appropriate to bring a gift. He couldn't return empty-handed after being gone for so long, otherwise Bullet would probably make fun of him. Thinking of this, Crocodile grabbed the blue light cabane's neck with his right hand and forcefully dragged him out of the fused colony. During this process, the cabane madly tried to claw, scratch and bite him. Unfortunately, everything was in vain, everything it encountered was gravel, and the former's strong grip made it impossible to break free. When the core was pulled out, the fused colony ceased to exist, and countless cabane and wreckage bodies fell to the ground. This scene made Crocodile frown. His devil fruit ability hadn't awakened yet, so he can't turn the land into a desert otherwise he can sink all these things into quicksand. However, he couldn't just ignore it. The mining city behind him is also his own gift in the eyes of Crocodile, and he cannot let these things destroy it. With these thoughts, he injected more power into the ongoing sand whirlwind, making it even more powerful and gigantic, managing to lift all of the cabane into the air before pushing them in the opposite direction of Yashiro Station. As for where this whirlwind of sand that was loaded with so many cabane would go, it was no longer his business. My God! A miracle! The whirlwind of sand, which expanded more and more, carrying the cabane with it spinning through the sky, 
had surpassed the height of the walls. Meanwhile, Crocodile, holding the cabane of blue light in one hand, transformed into wind and returned to the top of the wall. The soldiers and samurai prostrate on the ground became excited and revered him even more, bowing their heads deeper. Only their mouths trembled uncontrollably, constantly repeating the word God. God. Crocodile repeated. As Crocodile observed the behavior of the inhabitants of this world, he said to himself, it seems that in this world there are no special abilities like the devil fruit. But he didn't care to clarify that he was not a god, in fact, he thought it would be more convenient for normal communication. Of course, he wouldn't admit to being a god either. Since he would be joining the army under the world government, it was better to pay attention to this kind of thing. Remember, my name is Crocodile. Remember to open the door next time I come. After that, Crocodile went to the governor's residence and asked for two maps. One was a large map of the country, and the other was a route map recording important stations. Originally, he wanted a big map of this world, but who would have thought that there isn't one here? However, according to the governor the capital where the shogun was located had one. Seeing that he was so obedient, Crocodile also asked some other questions. How did those undead you call Cabane come from? Well, it is said that they came from the European continent, but we still don't know how they were created. What kind of minerals do they have here? Mainly iron ore. As he asked, Crocodile felt that continuing to ask would be endless. Under the nervous gazes of the samurai, he grabbed the back of the governor's uniform with his right hand. Ah! God! Please forgive me! forgive me. The latter suddenly screamed. He thought it was his rudeness last night that made Crocodile want to take revenge on him. Don't worry, I won't do anything to you, but I need you to come with me. After saying this, regardless of whether he agreed or not, Crocodile released a furious wind. At the same time, on the plane outside the destroyed city that was discovered by Lasky and Marta last night, there was an army. Under bullets orders, riding heavy motorcycles and wielding automatic rifles, they moved quickly among the cabane, while shooting at their legs. For a time, the loud gunshots and constant roar of motorcycles completely covered the vast plain. These people were the Army Heavy Motorcycle Brigade, led by Douglas Bullet. Although they had traveled all night, Bullet did not order them to rest. Instead, he asked his soldiers to do a brief check and verification of their weapons before dividing them into groups of ten, then he ordered them to perform elimination tasks in turns. However, the noise completely attracted the attention of the cabane within the city. A dense flow of undead poured out from the suspension bridge, truly looking like a moving black river. Seeing this, Bullet gave another order. Quickly, a group of soldiers turned the motorcycles in opposite directions attracting the cabane, while another group fired from the sides and occasionally threw grenades to bombard the cabane. The mobility of motorcycles and the range of automatic rifles were used to the maximum under bullets' orders. Roar! Suddenly, just when everything seemed to be in order, a cabane who was half a meter taller than his companions roared. He threw one of his companions like a sandbag hitting an army soldier on a motorcycle and sending him flying, creating chaos. Noticing this, the soldiers around them aimed and fired intensely. However, this cabane did an amazing act. He grabbed two of his companions and waved them like guns, blocking most of the bullets. Additionally, he had two cabane attached to his chest and back, acting as human shields. From time to time, he would throw the cabane in his hands towards the fast-moving motorcycles and then catch another cabane. The most surprising thing was that, with his roars, the surrounding cabane slowly gathered towards him, as if they were hypnotized. Um. At this moment, Douglas Bullet, sitting on a specially made oversized motorcycle, noticed this special cabane. Interesting, let's see how formidable you are. Swoosh. The next moment, his huge figure instantly turned into a black shadow. Then, she blinked and appeared above the special cabane's head. Bang! The army soldiers around could barely see bullets' movements. 
The next moment, the special cabane was subdued by an invisible force. Its head made a crunching sound as it hit the ground, forming a large crater and unleashing shockwaves in all directions with cracks spreading. When the smoke dispersed, there was no trace left at the bottom of the hole, only a mass of sticky flesh and blood. Huh that's it. Bullet looked contemptuously into the crater, then turned around to slowly head towards his heavy motorcycle, occasionally hitting the approaching cabane, shattering them and throwing them into the air. Move quickly. In two hours, I want to be relaxing in the city. Inside the dimensional gate base. Senior Director Addison had just hung up the call on the phone at the desk, but the look of surprise on his face did not dissipate for a long time. It's not surprising that Crocodile agreed to join the army, although it was much earlier than expected. But he actually found an intact human city, a city with a large iron mine and complete facilities, he also captured a cabane, the core of the fused colony, as well as the governor of that city. Any of these three things had extremely high value to the world government in the current situation. Thinking of this, Addison quickly turned the dial on the phone bug to contact the home base on the other side of the dimensional gate. He first told Crocodile's story, and then made an application, saying, We need an expert who is proficient in interrogation and torture. Okay, we'll take care of it. Immediately afterwards, he called Professor Fritz from the Institute of Biochemistry and told him that a special blue light cabane would be sent soon, and at the same time he gave the information about the fused colony introduced by Crocodile. So what are you waiting for? Send it right away. As expected, Professor Fritz was very excited after hearing this, but this also made Addison helplessly repeat what he just said. This needs to wait until Crocodile comes back. Just be prepared. After saying that, he hung up directly and stopped talking to the other party. He then had to organize a team to send gasoline and personnel responsible for exploration and intelligence to Bullet's location. Hey, I really envy that guy Carlson. He takes people on trips every day, delivers documents, and so on. How free he is. At this time, Addison no longer had the excitement of coming to this new world and was only left with a tired spirit. What he didn't expect was that Crocodile would not only agree to join the army earlier than expected but would also return earlier than expected. Dash. Chapter 96, Chapter 96, Shadows of Mary Geoasse The door to the base has been completely opened. Armed army soldiers lined up on both sides of the road and a group of smartly dressed government officials, led by Addison, were waiting for someone in front of the gates. However, that person did not keep them waiting for long. With a swirl of yellow sand, she appeared out of nowhere outside the door. Holding a cabane of blue light with one hand and grabbing the governor's back with the other, Crocodile slowly emerged from the whirlwind of sand. Bang! Crocodile carelessly threw the governor away leaving him in the hands of a man in black who was approaching, and said smiling, This is the governor of Yashiro Station, interrogate him yourselves, and as for this. But just as he raised the blue light cabane and still hadn't finished speaking, an old man dressed in white appeared at a surprising speed from the crowd. Pushing his glasses up, he observed the cabane in Crocodile's hands. It's really blue light. Can it really absorb other cabane? Who are you? Crocodile looked at him dissatisfied. This is Professor Fritz, the director of the Institute of Biochemistry. He is personally responsible for the research on cabane. Addison came over and smiled. Okay, I've given this to you too. Crocodile nodded indifferently and threw the cabane in his hand to the open space aside, not caring whether it would hurt anyone. A core without control and a replenishment of cabane is dangerous, but a core with nothing, even if its heart, blood vessels and pupils are blue, can only be considered a cabane that glows blue. As for the mental wave, it was obviously not dangerous, furthermore, even if it was, Crocodile wouldn't care. If it can hurt people in this base, then Crocodile really has to reconsider joining the army. After all, that would mean they are too useless. As expected, 
a man in black who came out at random easily pinned down the cabane, skillfully stuffed an iron ball into its mouth, and tied the straps to both sides of its head. Then, he cuffed his hands behind his back and quickly led him away by grabbing the back of his neck, the whole process taking no more than ten seconds. Seeing the special cabane being taken away, Professor Fritz lost interest and left. At the same time, an army officer walked forward, holding a neatly folded black military uniform, shouting vigorously, Welcome, Lieutenant General Crocodile, to join the army. Please wear your cloak. Oh. Crocodile raised his eyebrows, looked into the eyes of everyone present, then grabbed the fur coat on his shoulders and threw it aside. Then he picked up the cloak of black justice and placed it on his shoulders. At this moment, the pirate's crocodile is dead, and the army's crocodile is reborn. Suddenly, the army officer and Addison acutely noticed that crocodile's momentum had changed, or rather, his presence became much stronger. They felt as if a sand-colored crocodile was raising its head behind him. Are there any cigarettes? Lieutenant General, please. The army officer seemed to have been prepared for a long time, he took out a cigarette, lit it and offered it to Crocodile, who took it and took a deep inhale. When he exhaled the smoke, holding the cigar between his fingers, he opened his mouth and smiled with a complicated mood. Quahahahaha. The army continues to develop at full speed on the world of Cabane, while on Starfish the navy remains busy with large-scale operations to end the slave trade. During this process, the reputation of the world government in various nations has gradually shifted from fear to good awe. This is actually a very rare thing. On this day, the live public broadcast resumed worldwide. In the RL0002 region, on the continent of Red Earth, separated only by the RL0001 area where the new headquarters of the world government was being built, an event was taking place. Today this region was very lively and full of people, becoming the center of attention of the entire world. Are we really going to be let go? My God! Is this real? This is a dream, right? We of you we of you. Enslaved men and women were freed from explosive collars, and under the direction of officials, they formed long lines heading to predefined areas, awaiting the liberation process. In this process, the slaves newly arrived at Mary G.O.S.A. in recent months, overcome with emotion, cried uncontrollably. Some even hugged each other, feeling each other's warmth, even if they were strangers and regardless of gender. At this moment, everyone was the same. They were unfortunate people who regained freedom and a new life. And all this was broadcast by the propaganda department staff through the Den Den Mushi to the world audience. The scene was crowded with spectacular aerial shots showing that the entire RL0002 region was filled with slaves waiting to be freed. At that time, except for a few people who were skeptical and prejudiced against the world government, most people believed that the celestial dragons really did something good this time. No one bothered to ask if simply releasing them was enough. How would physical injuries, mental injuries, and lost time be accounted for? This world, after all, was not like a world with a complete legal system. In the eyes of most people, the descendants of the Creator, the Celestial Dragons, known as the Nobles of the World, are willing to respect and cooperate with the agreements of the Levely. This is the first time in hundreds of years that they have shown great mercy. This day was called the Great Liberation of the Holy Land by later generations. It was also included in history textbooks that became widely popular in the future. But if you want to free hundreds of thousands of slaves, it cannot be completed in one day. It took three days to officially announce the end. These three days, the live broadcast Den Den Mushi took turns continuously, even when most people went to sleep, the live images were still broadcast to prove authenticity. Not to mention, this trick thought up by the propaganda department really fooled 80% to 90% of the people. But what was the truth? The truth is that only more than 10,000 carefully selected slaves were actually released. These slaves had not been in the Holy Land for a long time, had not been tortured too much, and had relatively normal minds. 
and most importantly, they did not harbor extreme hatred. They were high-quality slaves. Where did the remaining slaves go? In fact, their explosive collars were also removed, but they were sent to the neighboring areas RL0003 and RL0004. The workers of the construction department have built infrastructure sufficient to accommodate their lives. Although these regions looked like fairly decent cities from afar, upon getting closer they became quite rudimentary. When the global live broadcast was closed and all the spotlights dissipated, the rest of the former slaves gathered again in the central plaza according to the radio orders. A senior official from the administration department stood on a high platform that had been prepared, holding a large loudspeaker and shouting at the thick crowd below. At the same time, Den Den Mushi with megaphones broadcast his voice in various locations. From now on, this will be your home. No one will enslave you, and no one will beat or scold you. You are the official residence of the first ordinary city on the Red Earth continent, and you should be honored and proud of it. But you must also learn to be self-reliant. The great world government has decided to fund all your agricultural tools, machinery, seeds, chickens, pigs, a year's worth of food and supplies, and you will also be exempted from four years of heavenly tribute. In other words, in the first year, you can live here without any worries, but from the second year on, you have to eat and use your own food. After saying all this, the official paused, then raised the megaphone again. I know it may be difficult to adjust to life here right away, but don't worry. We officials will stay here temporarily to help you and guide you on the right path. If anyone gets sick or injured, please notify us immediately. We will provide full medical services. However, once you have your own productions and income, all services will be chargeable. Of course, the government will also purchase goods from you. But even though he shouted like this with all his strength, the crowd below was still silent with a numb look on everyone's face. However, the world government officials present were not surprised. They believed that time was the best remedy and that, over time, in a relaxed and comfortable environment, normality would gradually be restored. This senior official stepped down from the stage and whispered instructions to his subordinates who came over. Let the undercover agents lurking among them keep an eye on them. Once you find someone showing hatred towards the world government and the celestial dragons, report it to the police immediately, but you must be careful not to be discovered by too many people. Understood. Imu was of course aware of foreign affairs, but after a brief understanding, he stopped paying attention because he was thinking about something very important. The security problem at Mary G.O.S.A. The Rayleigh intrusion incident a few days ago has shown that the towering cliffs several kilometers high on the Red Earth continent cannot stop determined and powerful people. In this aspect, both the Celestial Dragons and Cypher Paul were overconfident. Therefore, he had already ordered the five elders to solve this problem, at least ensuring that the edge of the Red Earth continent within Mary G.O.S.A.'s range is controlled so that it can no longer happen that someone can directly enter the Holy Land simply by climbing up. However, Imu always felt that the measures taken were still not enough. It's a shame that Imu still has no idea how to improve security. With no other option, we could only let the CP personnel stationed at Mary G.O.S.A. patrol in pairs. At Reverse Mountain, when boats from around the world follow the climbing currents to reach the top and then ride the rapids toward the Grand Line, they can always see two sets of bright lights from below. Although most people wouldn't choose to go over Reverse Mountain at night. In the dark waves not far from Twin Cape, a whale floated in the sea and slept peacefully. A figure appeared in front of the small stone house next to the lighthouse and gently knocked on the door. When the person inside opened the door, the yellow light instantly illuminated both of their faces. You are a middle-aged man, dressed in a pink t-shirt and blue shorts, with a yellow and purple floral ornament on his head, looked at the visitor in surprise. We haven't seen each other in over a year, Crocus-sama. Gaban, what are you guys doing? Crocus hesitated for a moment, finally he stepped aside and said, Come in. Thanks. Gaban looked at Crocus with respect, 
then thanked him and entered the house. The four people behind him also followed in turn. These people are the former crew members of the Roger Pirates. Among them, the leader, Gaban, is the third most powerful person on the ship after Rayleigh. Why are you all together? Shouldn't they have returned to their respective sea areas? After closing the door, Crocus turned around and looked at these people doubtfully. His situation is different from these people. Although he has been on the Roger Pirates ship for a while, he is not strictly a formal crew member. He is only a temporary ship's doctor responsible for treating and suppressing Roger's terminal illness. Sir, are you aware of Rayleigh's passing in Mary Geoasa? Gaban asked seriously. Crocus nodded and said, Of course, I have nothing else to do but read the newspaper all day. Then you should know that Rayleigh is not that kind of impulsive fool. He must have sensed that there was something important going on in Mary Geoasa before he took the risk to sneak in. In fact, I was also surprised by Rayleigh's behavior when I saw the news, so are you going to? Crocus looked at them hesitantly, and at the same time had an unpleasant feeling in his heart. 1. Dash. Chapter 97, Chapter 97, Shucky's Rebellion I contacted Shucky earlier. She said that Rayleigh felt that the recent changes in the world government and the source that ended Captain Rogers' planned age of great pirates could be found in someone or something on Mary Geoasa. That's why Rayleigh risked infiltrating Mary Geoasa to investigate. Gaban said. It is indeed very possible. Crocus thought about it and agreed with this conjecture. But Rayleigh still didn't pass on the information he found in the end, so we want to complete the matter on his behalf. Gaban said with firm eyes. It's too dangerous. If Rayleigh couldn't do it, you guys could. I know that Rayleigh is stronger than me, and even better than a few of us, but we still want to try while we are still in good condition, otherwise we will really be powerless when we get older. As he spoke, Gaban looked at the other four people and continued, even if we die, we want to die knowing the truth and pass it on to our companions before we die. Well. I guess it's not just you, right? Crocus asked. Yes, other crew members are also participating in this mission, but they are not in the Four Blues, so we agreed to meet on an island on the Grand Line. Gaban explained. Crocus asked strangely, how many crew members will participate? Also, it's Spencer who is going to make the action plan for you. Spencer was the strategist of the Roger Pirates. Often even Rayleigh followed his plans. He is married, so he doesn't want to take risks with us, but he is willing to receive the information we have gathered, and then deal with it based on the situation. Gaban sighed helplessly, rubbing the back of his head. And Sunbell also refused. He is worried that, amidst the recent friendly cooperation between Fishman Island and the world government, if it were to happen that a fishman infiltrated Mary Geoasa, it would be a disaster for the entire race. Others have their own problems too, and I don't want to force them. Gaban added. Crocus nodded in understanding. Yes, I understand. But now they don't even have a clear goal, just like Rayleigh didn't have before. Going to marry Geoasa without knowing what to look for can be dangerous, and I'm sure they've stepped up security there. To be honest, I don't recommend you go because you will most likely die without finding anything. But, just when Gaban was about to say something, the door behind him was pushed open with a bang, which shocked several people in the room. Yes, they are looking for their own death, and they will only die without any meaning. Said the unknown figure who opened the door. They immediately drew out their weapons and turned around to be on guard. Especially Gaban who instantly pulled out his two axes from his belt, his eyes flashing fiercely. However, upon seeing who entered, the momentum and hostility instantly disappeared. Shucky! This woman's personality seemed to have changed, she was no longer the same calm and kind woman who ran the bar. Rayleigh's purpose in infiltrating Mary Geoasa was to understand the origin of the changes in the world government, not to go looking for idle death and rush to meet Roger. Gaban and the other five remained silent, 
knowing that Shucky must have something to say. I want to avenge that bastard Rayleigh, and find out what he wants to know, so that I can tell him in the land of hell after death. But I need manpower and experts. Do you want to come together? After saying this, Shucky took the cigarette out of his mouth, held it between his fingers, and let the smoke rise. He kept his gaze fixed on the eyes of these people while Gaban and the others looked at each other. 1. Can you explain to us how you plan to do it? Regarding the recent changes in the world government, I have looked into them. Basically, they have abandoned their high-pressure politics of the last few hundred years and are leaning towards a softer, low-pressure policy. This shows that they have noticed that people around the world have reached a certain level of tolerance for tyranny, so they want to loosen the rope around their necks and at the same time improve the impression of the world government outside. Freeing the slaves is just a tactic to improve their image. According to the information I have, the world government has already begun to reform the heavenly tribute system, and it will likely be a topic in the next levely. After hearing Shucky's words, someone asked in surprise, that all sounds like a good thing, right? For the rest of the world, it's certainly great news. Shucky looked at him and said, but do you really think that the dark world government of over 800 years will suddenly become so compassionate? I don't think so. It is said that one's nature is hard to change, and this is not just true for people, but also for an organization. There must be a conspiracy hidden deep inside, and Rayleigh died for this. What are you really planning to do? Gaban asked again. Shucky's eyes flashed with hatred, but her face maintained an indifferent expression. Quite simply, disrupt and thwart what they want to do. Taking advantage of the beginning of the change in the world government, gather those extremely oppressed by the world government and by the nobles of each country, lead them to take up arms and overthrow the kings on their heads. Extend revolutionary thought to poor nations, small nations and every island in difficulty, completely mix the waters of this ocean. Gaban and the others were shocked by this woman's frightening idea but remembering her previous identity as a member of the Rocks Pirates, it no longer seemed so strange. Do you want to start a head-on war with the world government? Gaban shook his head helplessly and said, although our strength is not bad, it is difficult to stop the Navy's highest combat power. The others reluctantly nodded and admitted that this was true. The Roger Pirates are not the Rocks Pirates after all. They are not like the latter, where any member is a high-level fighter. No. You don't have to go head to head with them. You just need to secretly instigate and lead through the intelligence network I have built over the past decades. Once the large navy forces or main combat forces are dispatched, we can receive the news in advance and retreat. They will not be able to catch us. Saying this, Shucky's face was full of confidence. In the world, the only organization that could compete with her in intelligence gathering was the Cypher Paul. Speaking of high-level fighters, we can train them over the years or look for strong people that we can use. I don't think that overthrowing the world government is something that can be achieved in the short term. The important thing is the ideas. Pass on Roger's ideas and Rayleigh's ideas, so that the organization we founded can continue. 1. Simply put, Shucky wanted to spend the remaining half of his life creating a force that would displease the world government. That was his current purpose. Gaban and the others were the first backbones she used to build her power. Gaban was the first to speak. I see, well, consider me on your team. Instead of growing old doing nothing, I might as well squeeze out all the courage I have left. If it's for Captain Roger and Rayleigh, I'm willing. I do too. This is much more exciting than opening a boxing gym in my hometown. Let me teach the young members how to box in the future. Then I'll teach shooting. Leave the fencing in my hands, after all, I am a master of the sword. Good. Shucky had anticipated this result, so it didn't surprise him. She actively contacted Gaban and told him Rayleigh's story. She then looked at Crocus, who had not spoken. Crocus Sama, what about you? We really need your superb medical skills. Crocus pondered for a moment, shook his head, 
and rejected her. I'm sorry, but even if I don't mind, I have to try and take care of Laboon. It's an agreement I have with the Rumber Pirates. If he continues crashing like this, he will soon sink to the bottom of the sea. But if you have serious patients or complicated medical cases in the future, you can send them, I will try my best to treat them, even as a favor from the past. Shucky thought about it and felt it was okay. She could use this place as a safe house. Twin Cape was right below Reverse Mountain, and she could completely monitor the ships coming and going. As for whether she would divulge the information, she was not very worried. She had already fully investigated Crocus' situation. The reason he gave before was true, and after so long here, the world government didn't care about him either. Well, in that case, let's say goodbye first. Okay, go ahead and be safe. Crocus didn't want them to stay either. It was really too dangerous what these people were doing. He didn't have that many thoughts, he just wanted to spend his old age here with Laboon. By the way, as far as I know, the Rumber Pirates you mentioned were disbanded a long time ago. They may have been eliminated by another pirate group or may have fled the Grand Line. In short, they will never return. Said Shucky. Ah, I already know this. Shucky didn't say more and immediately left with Gaban and the others. They were going to meet up with other members of the Roger Pirates and see if they could gather more companions. This time they were not planning to break into Mary Gosa. They thought that there would be many people willing to join or help secretly. When they left, Crocus breathed a sigh of relief, sat down with a somewhat tired mind, massaged his temples, and said with a sigh, Isn't a quiet life better? Why live every day in a situation where we could die at any moment for an idea? He felt that Roger disbanded the pirate group instead of letting Rayleigh take over as captain and continue to lead the crew on adventures because he wanted them to have a happy ending in the rest of their lives. But now, Rayleigh's unexplained death made these crew members uneasy, especially Shucky, whose cold gaze was very uncomfortable. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Go to sleep, go to sleep. I'm just a middle-aged guy with some medical skills guarding the lighthouse. He watched Laboon outside the window as he lay down on the bed, finally falling asleep. But when he opened his eyes again, under the warm sunlight outside the window, he suddenly heard the sound of familiar music in his ears. It seems to come from outside the house. And there was also Laboon's familiar screech. But this time, in that sound there was no longer sadness and loneliness, but an emotion full of joy. Crocus quickly got out of bed threw open the door and walked out. But the moment the door opened, the sound of the music suddenly became louder, and he could better hear the cheerful music that echoed throughout Twin Cape. Listening carefully, he found that this was not the singing of one person, but the singing of many people. That is. Crocus's gaze swept towards a man in black with a slim figure, standing on the edge of the cliff in front of Laboon. Laboon swung his tail excitedly and swam back and forth, chirping at the man from time to time, causing a lot of waves to turn into raindrops and fall down, and then turned into a beautiful rainbow under the bright sunshine. The man seemed familiar to him. But just as Crocus was preparing to go down and take a closer look, he turned around and saw three people dressed in black walking towards him from the stone staircase. The leader had a gentle and comfortable smile on his face. Hello, Dr. Crocus, I am Carlson, a high official of the Department of Administration directly subordinate to the world government. It is a pleasure to meet you. 3. World Government Crocus's expression changed drastically, his body instantly tensed, and he thought to himself, did they find out about yesterday? This is bad. 